So good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ziad Masboudi. I'm with the city of Laguna Niguel, and I welcome you in Laguna Niguel. Well, thank you very much for coming. We have a lot of uh, board members, we have property managers, and, and we have uh, service providers, we have contractors, and then we have exhibitors that, that's here. That's been great. So what we'll be doing today is we're going to have a series of uh, lectures in here, presentations, and then we have exhibitors that have a lot of material for you here. And uh, we'll be talking about water efficiency, best management practices, uh, landscape, pest management. So we have a great half day here. And, and this partnership is truly a really good start of a partnership. And you'll hear more about it between the city of Laguna Niguel, city of uh, Aliso Viejo, Laguna Hills, uh, Molten Niguel Water District, Santa Margarita Water District, El Toro Water District. So we're a great team of partners that just put this all together in almost uh, two months. But uh, anyway, and, and we did great. And thank you for your attendance. I mean, our success is if you come out of here learning something and sharing it with others. So with that, I would like to invite uh, Mayor Genoway to welcome everybody. Hey, thank you, Ziad. And Ziad, thank you for all of your work on putting this together. We all really appreciate that. But good morning to all of you and welcome to our beautiful city of Laguna Niguel. It's truly a pleasure to be with you this morning. Our elected officials, our HOA board members and managers, and our service providers. We're here today to celebrate and support and explore connections between the two most important features of our South Orange County lifestyle, and that's homeowners associations and water. Today's event is the result of the vision of neighboring cities and water districts to make a difference in South Orange County. We have recently signed an urban runoff MOU between cities and Molten Niguel Water District to memorialize our commitment to saving water and to the environment. South Orange County cities have a history of working well together for common goals. We also have great partnerships with the water districts as the clients, they serve our residents and our businesses, so we have a great common interest. We pride ourselves in South County with the quality of life we have worked hard to maintain for our visitors, our businesses, our residents, and our children. This quality of life depends on healthy and clean environment and on having water in our faucets when you turn them on. Over the years, we have all heard of urban runoff and how it impacts our creeks and our oceans. South County would not be what it is without clean creeks and clean oceans. No tourists would come visit because our beaches, our beaches if the ocean was polluted and closed to swimmers due to high beaches or high bacteria or pollutants in the beaches. If we have no water to irrigate, then our beautifully landscaped parks, gardens, and medians would not be the talk of the county. However, we need to work together to eliminate urban runoff pollution. In South Orange County, homeowner associations cover the majority of our cities, so they are important and major partners in achieving our common goals. In Laguna Niguel alone, there are over 120 homeowners associations, covering a large percentage of the city's area, and I'm aware that this is more or less the case with most of the cities in our region. Depending on the level of service that the homeowners associations provide, these private associations have a major role in preserving and protecting our environment, that of the residents and the communities that they serve and live. Today's H2O for HOAs event is the first step in providing you with available resources from the various partnering agencies to help you become an effective partner in preserving our lifestyle, protecting the environment, and complying with the various laws and regulations. 90% of the water that we depend on for drinking, sanitary use, and even irrigation of our beautiful landscapes in South Orange County is imported from hundreds of miles away. We get about 10% of our water from small groundwater basins and some local recycling projects used for irrigation. Water in South Orange County is delivered by seven water agencies 
and city water departments. And we have three of them participating in today's event, so we'll hear more from them on this subject. We hope that you find today's sessions beneficial to you and that you share the information with your other board members, constituents, and with your neighbors. And again, welcome to Laguna Niguel. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. With that, I'll introduce the General Manager of Molten Niguel Water District, June Lopez. I love that I haven't even said anything and you're clapping. It's a good audience. It's always tough to follow the mayor because she said it all. There's not much else to say. But thank you so much for being here early in the morning to take time out of your busy schedule so you can come and get some great information. I want to thank the mayor and the city of Laguna Niguel, Ziad, for allowing us to have this event here in their beautiful facility. We wanted to make sure we had enough room, we had the right facilities to be able to talk to you and have our vendors interact and give you some items and tools and advice that will be very helpful. As the mayor mentioned, we have a lot of HOAs. Just in our service area, we have about 300 HOAs, and we serve about 170,000 people. When you look at all the customers, 75% of our customers live in HOAs. So it certainly makes sense to really do this targeted outreach to a community such as HOAs and others to really understand water usage. Because how you use water affects water reliability, quality, and also financially, because when you use water efficiently, you actually save money. So there's that incentive to use water wisely. And as we look at the environment, we know that how we use water impacts our environment. As the mayor mentioned, we have this exciting partnership. It's the first of its kind. Cities of Laguna Niguel, Laguna Hills, Aliso Viejo, Mission Viejo, Mo'o Niguel Water District, and also our partners, Laguna Blue Belt and Orange County Coastkeeper. We're working with County of Orange to really understand runoff. Because if we can mitigate runoff, we not only help reduce water usage, but also we can make sure that the health of our oceans and creeks are elevated. So there's a lot of multi-benefit in using water wisely. And really today is an effort of the staff. And just to name them all off again, Laguna Hills, Laguna Niguel, Aliso Viejo, Mission Viejo, El Toro Water District, Santa Margarita Water District, Mol Niguel Water District, we all are working together to serve you. Because one thing that we share in common, the greatest common that we have, is we all serve you. So we want to make sure we give you the information, the tools, to help you use water efficiently. And I'm sure for those of you that live in our service area, you've heard from our staffs a lot. We really believe in going to you. We don't expect you to always come to us. We're always available to talk to your board, to talk to your uh, communities. Anything that you need from us, we really believe in that extra step in the customer service because without you we can't make any of this possible and when we just went through a recent historic drought in our service area we were used as a model not only did our customers really come through to use water efficiently even once the drought emergency declaration was over we did not see a rebound and in a lot of communities, you see this spike in water usage again, but not in our community. In fact, what we heard from our customers is, we want to know what we can do to be more efficient. And so we've launched uh, advanced meter infrastructure to help you understand real-time water usage. We develop customer portals so you can know exactly when and how you're using the water to give you the information and the knowledge to do your part in making sure that we have reliability, great water quality, sustainability for all of our communities. So I know you will enjoy the presentations today because there's a lot of great information. But again, we also want to hear from you. What do you need from us? What can we do more of or better or different? So please feel free to give us your thoughts and concerns and questions throughout the day because this is, this is a team effort. It's not just us giving you the information but again we want to be there to help you to serve you and you have to let us know how we can do that better so thank you so much for being here and I know you will enjoy the day so with that I'll turn it back over to Ziad thank you very much, Mayor. well thank you Mayor Genoway and thank you June with that I'm gonna be turning over the mic to Jose Solorio he's gonna be your MC today and uh, as both the previous speaker said 
you are our partners. I mean, our success depends on how good we work together and how we can deliver a message that makes sense to you. I mean, we're not here just to crack regulations. We want you to understand why it's good for you and it's good for us. So please enjoy the day and uh, ask us. We want to hear from you. Thank you very much. Ziad and the mayor need to go back to running the city. So uh, let's give him a big round of applause and the mayor, though, for hosting us and having us here. And you heard from uh, June Lopez, the very dynamic leader that we have at Moulton Niguel and, uh, you know, m members of the board of directors as well. Uh, next, I'm pleased to first help introduce two presentations before we take a little break uh, back in the other room. For each of the presenters, uh, they're going to be here during the day, so during the break, and at the end, there'll be opportunities for you to ask them questions. But after each presentation here, you know, we may have time for one or two questions, but we really want to save that for one-on-ones in, in the back. Um, speaking of cities, uh, we also have a great partnership with the city of Mission Viejo, and we are very pleased to have... Uh, one of their top engineers, who is the assistant city engineer now at the city of Mission Viejo, uh, w w one of the best. Uh, he's going to be talking about stormwater, best practices. Joe Ames, come on up. Let's give him a big round of applause. He's been an engineer for a while. I was looking for gray hairs. He didn't have many, but I know he, he has the experience and is going to do fantastic. We have some, some slides as well. So uh, I'm Joe Ames, I'm with the city of Mission Viejo. Oh great, thank you very much. Um, I was thinking about that normally they save the best for last for presentations, so I'm not exactly sure why I'm first, but that's okay, you know, maybe that says something about it. Um, joke. Um, so um, thank you for coming. Uh, we're gonna talk about stormwater program BMPs, also urban runoff prevention BMPs, that's what these actually are as well. Um, so you do not have a hard copy of this presentation. First bullet's wrong right off the bat. You're going to get a link later on uh, via email to download the presentations. It's more environmentally friendly than handing you a bunch of paper. Plus it's more easily distributable. Um, we also um, have some handouts at the booth, the Mission Viejo booth, about some sample contract document language that you can include in your landscape maintenance contracts. It's just an example but I'll be talking more about that later, and also a list of websites and contact information. So um, in order to have a basis of understanding, we really need to talk about some basic terminology and basic understanding of things. And one thing is the difference between the sewer versus the storm drain. So indoor water gets treated at a treatment plant, all of you probably know, and outdoor water that runs into catch basins along public streets and even on private streets, generally flows untreated to local creeks and to the ocean. So it's important to make that distinction. And the other term that I want to talk about is what is a watershed? A uh, watershed basically is a geographical area draining into the ocean or other body of water through a single outlet and includes the receiving waters. For instance, the city of Laguna Niguel City Hall that we're standing at today, we're in this valley right here. This drains out to, I believe, Salt Creek Beach in Dana Point. So we're within the Salt Creek watershed. And here's an example of the Elisa Creek watershed, which is just north of us, um, showing the, the various cities, all of which are mostly here today. And last but not least, we've got this terminology called uh, best management practices, and it's important to note that these are practical and economically achievable measures such as good housekeeping, education, and maintenance practices to reduce or eliminate discharges of pollutants. That's what you're here for today. We're asking you to implement BMPs in a good faith effort that are economically practical, economically achievable and practical. That's what we're asking you to do. Um, and Part of the program goal here is increase understanding and implementation of appropriate BMPs to prevent pollutants from reaching waterways in the Pacific Ocean. Um, if you do not know, there in Orange County, there are, we are governed by two different regional boards. One is the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board, and one is the San Diego County Regional Water Quality Control Board. 
Uh, the regulations that apply in South Orange County that the cities are mandated to implement come from the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, and the San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board has given us a permit that we need to implement, and part of it is concerns existing development. And they were kind enough to break out the existing development program into five areas, residential, commercial, and industrial, municipal, and construction components. And those are some of the things that we reach out to the HOAs and commercial and industrial uh, businesses that are out there, and we ask you to implement BMPs to prevent pollutants from reaching our local waterways in the Pacific Ocean. Interestingly, HOAs are considered a blend of residential BMPs and commercial BMPs, kind of makes sense. You're running many cities out there, and you're a business in some regards, so that's part of the reason why we're going to be talking about residential and commercial BMPs today. So here are some common interest area and homeowner association um, area activities that generate pollutants. And these are the ones I really want to focus on today. Uh, automobile parking and washing, landscaping and irrigation, community center operations and maintenance, recreation area operations and maintenance, any maintenance yard operations you might be engaged in, hardscape, fountain, and pool maintenance, and street and storm drain maintenance. And we have this handy little table here. These are some potential pollutants that come from each of those kinds of activities. Um, sediments, nutrients, pathogens, coliform, we're talking about bacteria there. Um, foaming agents, metals, hydrocarbons, hazardous materials, pesticides and herbicides, and other pollutants can come from uh, mismanagement of these kinds of activities. Here's another table. Oops. Um, and of course, BMP implementation can be, um, varies a little bit depending upon whether or not you own or operate storm drain systems or streets. Some HOAs don't maintain those items, some do. So I'm kind of broken down the BMPs into BMPs that relate to HOAs that do and do not maintain streets and storm drains. And there are BMP fact sheets out there that you can reference for each one of the activities. The cities have posted them on their websites. Mission Viejo included, Elisa Viejo included. The County of Orange is the stormwater program uh, manager for the, for the Orange County program. Um, they have information on their website. This is their website, ocwatersheds.com. It's a snapshot here. Likewise, Elisa Viejo has a website. Laguna Nigal has a website. Oops. Laguna Hills has a website. Mission Viejo has a website. The basic premise of BMPs for pollution prevention are aligned with these ideas here. Use safer products, recycle and reuse, reduce exposure, use dry cleanup methods, not hosing down things, properly storing and labeling materials. These are some samples of some fact sheets. As I mentioned, the county stormwater program is the overall manager of the stormwater program. They develop a co the collective fact sheets that you can reference. They're generally numbered in this fashion, even on the city's websites. So for instance, if you wanted to know about an activity, for instance, about cleaning of sidewalks, plaza, and entry monuments and fountains, there's actually a BMP fact sheet labeled FP4. Not very, it's not a very, um, it's, uh, yeah. And then there's uh, landscape maintenance, including irrigation, fertilization. There's a couple of fact sheets related to that. So one of the things that um, we're trying to address is uh, pollution prevention techniques that to prevent oil and hydrocarbons from automobile parking, long-term automobile parking. And we're, one of the problems is vehicles leak motor oil and block street sweepers from picking up trash and leaf debris. So some suggested solutions include asking your residents to move their vehicles during street sweeping and cleaning times, 
asking your residents to perform routine maintenance on vehicles to minimize leaks, asking your residents to place drip pans underneath leaking vehicles, and asking your residents to dry use dry cleaning methods to remove material deposited by vehicles. One of the things that we talk about is vehicle washing. I know that some of the HOAs prohibit vehicle washing. It's one of the best things you can do. You actually want to encourage your residents to be lazy. You want them to take their car to the car wash because every time they wash down their vehicle, all of that sudsy stuff goes into the local creeks and the waterways. But more importantly, most of people, when they try and wash their cars, are jetting water on the car and they're washing off concentrated pollutants of metals and dust along with that soap and our waterways. Be much better to take it to a car wash because all of that stuff gets treated and recycled over there. And plus, um, car washes recycle their water, so you're actually doing water conservation as well. What's wrong with this picture? Hardscape maintenance. Pressure washing washes concentrated pollutants in the storm drain system. So here we are at a gas station. They're washing off concentrated pollutants that probably got deposited on the ground throughout the day, including gasoline and who knows what else. And it's being washed down the pad and it's going in the nearest catch basin untreated to the local waterways. So you shouldn't be doing that. If you do do that, you need to block the nearest catch basin and recover the wash water. It's actually the law. So if you have vendors that are doing this, we ask that you remind them to block the nearest catch basin and recover the wash water. Shop vacs are cheap and plentiful at Home Depot. You can get those and they can be, um, and you can dump the wash water into the sanitary sewer system. You can also deposit it in a landscaped area. It's okay to do that. Landscape maintenance. So, Organic waste, fertilizer, and pesticides can migrate into storm drain systems. That's part of the problems. Leaf, leaf debris, grass clippings, that kind of thing. Um, all green waste should be, must be collected and disposed of properly. The catch basin is not where green waste should be blown into. All of you know that. I know that all of you know that. We're just reminding you that that is a best management practice that should be implemented. Also, you're supposed to be recycling green waste. I don't want to get too far into solid waste and, and green waste recycling programs, but Assembly Bill 1826 requires it. I believe, and I could be wrong, and I'm also be open to discussion on that, that landscape waste is mostly being taken these days to someplace like Tierra Verde Industries out in Irvine, where you're actually recycling some of the green waste. And that's being used as alternative daily cover at the landfill in between the day's runs of depositing trash at the landfill. Landscape maintenance solutions for fertilizer use, follow the manufacturer's directions, don't over fertilize, fertilize only when plants are actively growing, keep fertilizer off impervious surfaces, and sweep it back onto the lawn or planted area, maintain a buffer zone around surface water bodies. I know that many of you will implement integrated pest management as well. For pesticide use, we appreciate that. There'll be some more discussion about that later this morning. So for pesticide use, again, follow directions, don't overuse, keep off impervious surfaces, maintain a buffer zone, integra utilizing integrated pest management practices, properly store, dispose of, and clean up spills. Oops. Here's one of my favorite topics as soon as this thing cooperates with me. What's wrong with this picture? Missing a lot of, <laughs> there's no landscaping on the hillside. Um, so there's a few problems with this picture, m mostly due to, I mean, besides it being a major liability, but beyond that, um, in terms of um, erosion control, sediment is considered a pollutant of the local waterways because when sediment gets in waterways and water bodies, it chokes off aquatic life. And not having anything on the hillside here is a problem from an erosion control perspective, and it's probably going to lead to some other issues later on as well. Um, we ask that if you have a situation where you are in the process of landscaping a hillside that you use temporary fiber rolls. This is an example 
of the installation of temporary fiber rolls. You put them along the contour lines, you stake them in. There's a cross section there that needs to be embedded two to four inches into the side of the soil. Um, they're supposed to be at an appropriate intervals. Um, I believe 10 feet is the interval. It's ideal, it slows down the water when it goes down the hillside, helps prevent erosion from happening. It's not terribly expensive. Even better yet, hydro seed the hillside if you can't afford to do install permanent landscaping. There's a lot of homes around here. You can look even outside some of the windows over here that have large hillsides. Uh, it used to be common practice to disc hillsides. Disking hillsides rips up all of the weed roots, creates an erosion problem. Similar to, it winds up looking like that if you disc a hillside. We would prefer that you mow the hillside. You want to keep the roots in place from the weeds that are there. It's, be it's better than totally disking the hillside. Irrigation system maintenance. Interestingly, in South Orange County, in our San Diego Regional Water Quality Control Board permit, it, irrigation runoff is technically illegal. The cities are mandated to try to enforce that. We're taking the stance right now that we're gonna educate you first on the problem and that we're going to talk to you about adjusting your irrigation systems, your irrigation timers, to try to prevent runoff from going in the storm drain system. That picture in the lower right is what the Regional Water Quality Control, Control Board deems to be a violation. They actually put that in the presentation. If it hits the catch basin, it's a violation. So, and they had a press release in 2015 regarding that. I got that press release, most of us got that in the cities. And so it uh, was especially acute when we had the drought. Um, the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the State Water Resources Control Board partnered to send out this message to all of us. But the message is still valid even today. Um, community pool operation and maintenance. Uh, one of the things that we once that we see is is diametaceous earth in the gutter lines, not necessarily from HOA pools, but more from residential pools. For some reason, backwashing out of filters without collecting the material, it's been a problem. So we'd like you to remind maybe one your residents and maybe a newsletter at some point in time to please tell them to properly clear out their pool filters and to retain the the diametaceous earth. How many of you have these uh, pet waste stations in your communities? Hugely important. Um, it prevents, picking up pet waste prevents bacteria from reaching our local waterways. Um, dogs are, are warm-blooded animals. They uh, harbor bacteria in the feces, and we'd like to have it picked up. And it's a fairly low cost item to provide. I have one in my HOA where I live, right outside on the green belt, back of my home. Disposal of green waste again. Um, please don't dispose of it in catch basins, even on your private HOA catch basins. Those do connect to the city system and they do drain out to local waterways. So please cover your catch basin inlets if you're going to be blowing leaf debris or green waste around prior to raking it up. It's very helpful to do that. Um, it keeps the storm drain system from clogging up too. So it's good for best, best management practice from a maintenance perspective. If you have outdoor storage of materials, none of the HOAs look like this. These are terrible photographs, by the way. Uh, this, is, this is more like large scale commercial stuff. But if you have stockpiles like this, they, they need to be covered for, from both a wind erosion perspective and also from a stormwater perspective. Trash containers. We ask that you inspect your trash containers for damage and repair replaces needed. In fact, if you have a damaged dumpster or a damaged trash container, your local 
solid waste disposal company, either waste management or CRNR, will replace it for you. They'll do that. You just call them. Secure trash containers and provide secured covers wherever possible. If you do that, you'll have less wind blown debris, waste, trash waste blowing around. And for those lucky HOAs with privately owned streets and storm drains, we would appreciate if you maintain a consistent sweeping schedule. Once per month is the recommended minimum. I don't know what all of the best management practices are these days for street sweeping, but it would be helpful if you do it at least once a month. Avoid street cleaning during wet weather, and please do not open up fire hydrants and wastewater and flush down streets. Storm drains. You should annually inspect and clean drainage facilities. Eliminate any discharges that may occur while maintaining and cleaning drainage facilities. Implement a storm drain stenciling program if you don't already have one in your community. Most of the cities around here have storm drain markers or stencils that you can borrow and use to mark your storm drains. Your public works department can help you with that. And we would appreciate you reporting all observed illicit connections and discharges to the 24-hour water pollution program reporting hotline. Or at least your residents should be doing that. For construction and maintenance projects, um, many of you do projects to obviously maintain um, your, your communities. Um, here are some examples of some BMPs being placed during construction and maintenance. Over at a couple of the booths, Mission View did not bring any. We brought you shopping bags instead. But over at the Laguna Niguel and the Laguna Hills booth, I noticed there was these construction runoff guidance manuals, which has more detail about what to do during construction projects, implementing or installing sandbags, berms, covering catch basins, the BMPs that we'd like you to address during a construction project. There's a picture of the cover. But like I said, there are copies back there until Hal runs out, maybe. And then um, within the manual is our series of, there's a diagram here about small construction sites. Really applies to some of the more compact um, areas that we have in HOAs. It illustrates the do's and don'ts for construction. We would appreciate it if you incorporate requirements into your landscape contract documents or your other vendor contracts. Um, your local stormwater program manager can give you examples. The cities here in South Orange County generally contract for landscape maintenance. We are not necessarily the most knowledgeable people in it, but we do actually have some sample contracts we're more than happy to share with you. They're actually public information. I have samples back at uh, the Mission Viejo booth of what we put in our Mission Viejo landscape contracts. Basically, it's just reference to the permit that you need to implement BMPs, and then in our landscape maintenance contract, we actually include some of the fact sheets. The work is mostly done for you. You just need to, add, you just need to go to these websites and then download the items that are applicable for your contract. We ask that you train and retrain your employees and contractors in implementation of BMPs, and that you educate your residents in your HOA newsletters. Sometimes, if you're like at the HOA that I live in, not in this area, um, sometimes you are struggling to find content to put in your letters to fill up space. Maybe that's not always the case. Maybe you've got a very active group of people and there's lots of people that want to say something. But if you're looking for content to fill up a newsletter, check out one of their websites and download an informational item that month. Include it with your bill. So in conclusion, we've got a countywide unified program that has been developed to improve water quality, common interest area and homeowner association area maintenance activities can impact water quality. We're asking you to implement BMPs to reduce pollutants. And we have those fact sheets posted on the city website and on the OC Watersheds websites that will give you guidance on how to do that. And I have an example of one, like I said, back at the Mission Viejo booth. For more information, you can contact, you can go to OC Watersheds. 
I also took the liberty of throwing everyone under the bus today and putting all of the city representatives' names, telephone numbers, and email addresses on this web page, which you'll have an opportunity to go ahead and download later when we email it out to you, so there's no hiding over here. Uh, thank you for attending and learning how you can help prevent uh, waterway and ocean pollution. Again, he'll be available uh, you know, during the break and afterwards for more one-on-ones, but is there any uh, burning question or two that you may have for the presenter? Yes. I was interested in a hard copy of the presentation. So in an effort to be more environmentally friendly, we're not providing a hard copy of it. But what we are doing is we're emailing all of you a PDF copy of it. So you can print as many copies as you like that are necessary. That a BMP? Is the screening of storm drains uh, part of the BMPs? And if so, who's responsible for that? So catch basin debris screens are, is a, a great best management practice. As a matter of fact, we have a vendor out in the back. G2 Construction Incorporated has got uh, catch basin debris screens. It is a recommended BMP, but of course, like those kind of structural BMPs, there's a cost associated with it. Uh, we are currently, there's no mandate necessarily to install them at this time. However, the state of California the state of California has passed something called the Trash Amendments that has required all of the cities in the state of California to address trash from high priority areas over the next 10 years. So all of the cities are working on implementation plans to address trash not only from high density residential but also from commercial, industrial and like arterial highways. So it's something that we're working on. Of course, if you'd like to install catch basin debris screens, we'd appreciate it. Just a quick question. Um, why is diatomaceous earth problematic? Because some of us use it to um, put around areas to avoid insects coming through our, our hardscapes. It's not a problem as long as it doesn't wash in the storm drain system. Di diatomaceous earth it wouldn't, is not good for aquatic life. That's, that's really the main issue. Uh, I noticed the uh, storm drain that was uh, in your presentation uh, looked like there possibly could have been some water coming in from the top portion of the drain. And did I understand you to say that this is illegal? So, um, yes. So water entering a catch basin is considered illegal if it's from an irrigation source. Um, but like a lot of things in life, it's also illegal to drive more than 45 miles an hour on Crown Valley Parkway. So there's, I mean, so there's some selective enforcement going on, and, and that's kind of how, like a lot of things are in life that we're looking at. So we're, we've been mandated to do enforcement of it. We're starting with public education first. It's part of the reason why we're here today. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you so much, Joe. An excellent PowerPoints, and again, uh, you know, via email, we'll be sh sharing those with you. So please make sure you leave us your email at the front if you already haven't. Uh, before I present our next speaker, I do also want to introduce and, and welcome, just so you can all say hi to him, uh, council member here, actually now Mayor Pro Tem. So he's been uh, elevated, John Mark Jennings. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem here in Laguna Niguel. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, also next, uh, we have uh, a fantastic presentation on water efficiency uh, by Moulton Niguel, Zone Water Efficiency Manager. Uh, and you know we have a, a staff and a board that's very supportive of water efficiency efforts. And I know he was recognized earlier, but I'll recognize him again. We're pleased to have uh, with us the Vice President of the Moulton Niguel Water District, Scott Collins. Thank you and welcome. Thank you for supporting this great event. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Lindsay Stuvik, our Water Efficiency Manager. Good morning, everybody. Is there a slide advancing? No. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Thank you. Okay, my name is Lindsay Stuvik. I'm the Water Efficiency Manager at Molten Legale Water District. I'm really excited to see everybody in here. I've been in water efficiency for a long time, and we've always wanted to do a lot of outreach with HOAs and with our landscapers and property managers, and, and we're really excited to get to know everybody and very excited to introduce some of our programming to you. So I'm here representing a couple of other water agencies as well, El Toro Water District and Santa Margarita. They were all a part of uh, collaborating on this effort. So I'm going to try to address at a higher level some of the programs that we have in common. But as you know, we're all different. We all offer different programs because we have different needs in our service areas. So if you get a chance during the break or at the end of the presentation, just stop by our table and you know, tell us what you're interested in because we're always looking to pilot and partner and, and look into new things. Um, so just so I can get kind of the lay of the land here, if you guys could, if you're from an HOA board or a landscape committee, if you could raise your hand for me. Hey, we got good representation. How about property managers? Okay, and then our landscapers. Where are you guys? Okay, good. We got a pretty diverse room, so that's really good. We're going to focus a lot on outdoor uh, water efficiency today, since that's the majority of where HOAs uh, have to manage their water. And so I hope you find a lot of value in the presentation. If you have questions, we have time for one or two afterwards, but like I said, you can catch up with me in, during the break. So before I get started talking about water efficiency, I want to talk about why it's so important. Uh, water supply in our area in particular is mostly imported. We don't have the hydrogeology of North Orange County where they've got big kind of piggy banks of aquifers sitting in the ground that they can hold on to. We have very poor soils to hold on to water and so we import 100% of our water. Um, and it's a little expensive. You know, if you don't have a local supply like that, it, it does become expensive and so we try to keep costs down by keeping levels of water consumption efficient. Um, I want to show you a little bit about where your water comes from. So what you can see up here is a map of the state. Um, on, on an average year, we import about 45% of our water through the state water project. That travels 40 or 450 miles from around the Sacramento area south. And that's just to the north of LA. It still has to go through more distribution uh, to get down here to South Orange County. Uh, the remaining 55% comes from the Colorado River, which you can see is in red. It travels about 250 miles through the California aqueduct to get here. Metropolitan usually blends the water and treats it, and we purchase it at the Deemer plant. Um, and actually, our group, El Toro, uh, Santa Margarita, us, and a couple of other water agencies have gone together to try to enhance our reliability and we've actually built a second treatment plant called the Baker Treatment Plant that we all purchase water from. We can actually purchase untreated water and treat it there. Untreated water is less expensive than purchasing treated water directly. And so it's given us some redundancy and some reliability in our system. And it's made it so that we don't have to purchase the most expensive source of water and we maintain our reliability. Um, but one thing I want to add, too, is that, you know, during the drought, we had a 0% allocation or a very low percent allocation from the state water project. And we rely on Metropolitan to get our water supply to us. And during that time, they were actually able to re-engineer their entire system to take Colorado River water and supply it all the way up to Ventura County. It's a huge engineering marvel. And then the following year, when we had a deluge of water, 14 inches of rain, which we hardly ever see, we're able to supply almost entirely state water project water. And so we have a very reliable system, but those kind of feats of engineering drive up the cost. And so that's why I want to be very clear that imported water is expensive. And that's one of the reasons that we've invested so much into efficiency, because the cheapest unit of water is the one you don't have to buy. And so <laughs> that's why we're really investing in this. We also have worked together, and all of the agencies have invested in local supplies like recycled water. Um, in fact, a lot of our irrigation portfolio is made up of recycled water, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, because you probably have meters like that in your HOAs. So what are some of the benefits of efficiency? Joe touched on some of them earlier, but really, like I said, the cheapest unit is the one you don't have to buy. You save water, you save money. Um, another benefit is you reduce runoff or hopefully avoid it altogether, and you avoid property damage. Who is familiar with that cracked asphalt right there and how much it costs to re-slurry asphalt? It's expensive, and if you can avoid it by mitigating the runoff that comes off your property from that irrigation system, you can extend how long it takes to basically invest in repair work to your infrastructure and your property sites. Um, and the secondary benefit, just as Joe was saying, it improves the quality of our local creeks, our local beaches. We all 
live here and recreate here for a reason. We like the beach. We like to go and visit it, um, and we don't want to see it get you know harmed by pollution. Also, by keeping our demands at an efficient level, we can delay investment or even avoid it altogether in infrastructure and storage projects, which are capital improvement projects that cost millions of dollars. So by avoiding having to invest in those systems, we actually get to keep rates lower. And so efficiency doesn't just touch on some of the environmental benefits. It's got, it really does have a financial benefit to it. And we just want to stress that that's one of the reasons that we push it. We're trying to keep rates low and we're trying to avoid having to invest in infrastructure if we can, you know, stay efficient. So one of the ways we do it, and we used to rely very heavily on rebate programs, uh, but you know now we've had a couple of very large droughts over the last decade, and we've really expanded our portfolio of demand management tools. And some of you, in fact, most of you are probably very familiar with our turf removal program. Um, turf removal has just been a huge, a huge program over the last, I would say, eight years or so. Collectively, between the three water agencies here today, we have removed 7.4 million square feet of turf just in our three service areas, um, which is a huge amount. Um, and it's also acted to save quite a bit of water. Uh, we also realized that in terms of customer engagement, we need to find ways to reach out to you guys. Um, we've done targeted marketing. You'll see later we're going to talk about portals and other ways to you know, have like your portal and your information or be able to pay your bill from your, like, your handheld phone. Um, and just to make it easier for you to interact and engage in our programs. And then we also have education programs. We're here today. This is our HOA education program. We also work with children and get the next generation educated on water efficiency. We have workshops. Um, and we also have professional landscape training. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later today. And we'd love to have you guys uh, participate in that as well. And then finally, we prepare for the next drought or the next outage by preparing water shortage contingency plans. So that way, if there's an outage from Met or there's a big earthquake, or if we have another drought, we're prepared and we can implement those things quickly to make sure that everybody has enough water for health and human safety. So the most effective demand management tool that we have, and I'm speaking for all the agencies now because we're all water budget-based rate agencies, is the water budget based rate, excuse me, water budget based rate structure. You can say that five times fast. <laughs> um, so it is our most effective demand tool. We actually had a study where we worked with UC Riverside and they looked at consumption levels prior to the implementation of, of our budget um, and after, and we saved on average about five to 15% of demand. And that translates to not having to purchase about $4 million worth of supply every year. So that's $4 million that doesn't get passed on to ratepayers because we're able to keep demand at an efficient level. Um, what it does is it provides a customized water budget to all of our all of our customers. And we have different ways of calculating that and you can find all that on our website. And like I said, we're all different so there's different ways to calculate budgets. So make sure if you're operating in Laguna Woods or Laguna Niguel or Lisa Viejo, you know which water agency you're working with so you can get the right equation. And we'll go through some of those later too. But basically it's sending you a monthly price signal every month. If you notice that every month you're paying $200, $200, and suddenly you see it start to sneak up a little bit, that's an indication that you could have a leak or that you might be overwatering. And so we try to use it as a tool to help customers stay efficient and catch those small leaks before they become large leaks that could damage your property like we saw earlier. Okay. This is great because we've got a lot of landscapers in the room. And also, I think it's good, too, for property managers and HOA members to understand kind of how the outdoor water budget works and what are some of the elements involved in calculating it. And again, these are going to be different for every agency. But for the most part, these elements are common to all outdoor water budgets. So what you'll find is there's going to be, you know, oh, good, there's an illustrative formula right there. We're going to take your irrigable area into consideration. They're all customized for your particular meter. So if your meter f serves 1,000 square feet or 100,000 square feet, we're going to plug that into your equation, and you're going to get that uh, in introduced into your budget. So that way it's customized to you. Um, the next element is evapotranspiration. It's basically just a measure of the loss of moisture to the atmosphere, and it's a combination of evaporation and plant transpiration. Plant transpiration is just plant sweat. Plants lose water all day long through their leaves, and there's a certain percentage that we can measure. And then, you know, on hotter days, there's more solar radiation, you're going to lose more water to evaporation, and we take that into consideration. Um, next is plant factor. So we introduce a plant factor because we know that you're going to be irrigating a certain type of landscape. 
Um, if you look at that, we actually use a 0.7 for our potable budget. Um, the highest is 1.0. It's based on the most water loving bluegrass or Kentucky bluegrass turf out there. And then it scales down from there. And so the 0.3 to 0.5 range are drought tolerant plants. And I would say anywhere from like 0.1 to 0.15 are where native plants are. So as you can see, they get smaller and smaller and smaller for plants that require less water. Um, and so we've got about a 0.7. That's somewhere in between like a, a warm weather turf and a cold weather turf. Um, and then finally, conversion factors. This is, this is the actual calculation for your bill. So we want to make sure that the final outcome is in a billing unit. And so sometimes you'll see one, sometimes you'll see two. We have to divide by 0.62 and blah, blah, blah. But you know, everybody's got a different kind of formula. Um, but one thing I also want to point out is all of those are constants for the most part with the exception of evapotranspiration. That is going to change daily with the weather and with the time of year and even your location. And so we're going to walk through a little bit of evapotranspiration just to give you guys some of the basic understanding so that way you know, well, why is my budget going up in the summer and going down in the wintertime? So these are just some of the basics. Um, it also has its own formula. It includes solar radiation, air temperature, humidity, and wind speed. Do you notice what's not in there? Rain. Right, yeah, we do not reduce your budget if it rains. That's a freebie. You get to just use that for supplemental irrigation. <laughs> yeah, so we do not include rain in here. Um, basically, the, it's weighted heavily towards solar radiation. So as you guys can see, um, in the height of the summer, when we have the longest days of the year and the hottest time of the year, it peaks where it says plant water demand. And then as we, as we enter into the fall, you can see it's got kind of this precipitous drop off. And that's because the days start to get shorter really quick. Now it still stays hot. We all know it can be 95 on Thanksgiving, um, but the sun goes down around 530. And so if this equation is weighted heavily towards solar radiation, we're actually gonna see it fall off. And that's where we see a lot of customers go over budget is in the fall because it's still kind of warm. Um, but and they're still watering as if it's summer, but your plants don't need as much water. And so that's one of the things that we're here to kind of educate on is um, how evapotranspiration works and how it changes throughout the year. You can see it gets very low even in the winter. And it even says it on the slide. I'm glad we're gonna send this out. As the days get shorter, your landscape needs less water regardless of temperature. Okay, so here's what I also wanted to illustrate. It's not just the time of year that ET goes up and down. You're also gonna see, and this is kind of a, a, a map of the microclimates in our service area. If you're closer to the coast, you have a marine layer that comes in and you know, you're not really getting quite the solar radiation and you got nice humidity all day. You can see we only lose about 42 inches of that moisture through, throughout the year, that's the dark blue. But as you get further inland and it gets hotter, it's a little more arid, you actually lose quite a bit more in ET, and you can see like they'll actually lose 10 inches more in ET throughout the year in the more inland or the interior areas where it's hotter. Um, and so what we've done over here is just provide an illustration. You can see in the summer it peaks, it goes down in the winter, peaks again in the summer, and then that blue band is actually showing you the range of ET that you're gonna find in the service area. So what you can actually see is that in some cases in like the middle of July, you may actually have four inches of ET up to six. That's all in one service area. So you have to know basically where your location is, where your ET sources are, especially for our landscapers. If you don't know how to get daily ET, call your water district. We've all developed tools or our monthly ET to help you identify what the ET is so to help you manage water better. And just kind of a simple illustration, if you had a thousand square feet of turf throughout the year, um, as you can see on here, um, it would give you anywhere from about two and a half CCF to about four CCFs during the peak of the summer. Those two and a halfs are for the people that live by the coast. The four is for the people that live in the inland area. And that's because it's just hotter, um, more solar radiation. So again, we're gonna send these slides out and that way you can kind of see how the progression works. Um, but I think it'd be really helpful just to have as a reference uh, just because ET, like I said, is, is the thing that drives the variation in the budgets. And so it's good to understand it and it's good to know where the resources are to get more information on it. Um, and also another good place for a resource is your bill. So on all, of, on all of our bills, you can see the square footage that's going into it, what your ET total for the month was, and you can calculate your budget yourself if you'd like to.
or if you need to change your square footage, I think all three agencies have the ability to go out and remeasure and, and change our, or change your square footage if you feel it should be larger. So just give us a call. Okay, so we're back to recycled water. Um, most of our irrigation actually is served by recycled water, and we did that because it offsets potable. Um, like we talked about earlier, we import all of our potable water, so anytime we can take a locally produced source like recycled water and distribute it to customers, that offsets all that potable demand and helps keep costs down. Um, there, are, If you don't already have recycled water, most of the agencies have done a recycled water master plan, and we know where it's more cost effective to install or to convert potable to recycled water, so call your local agency. MET has an on-site retrofit program where you can get some assistance in doing the conversion. And a lot of the other, uh, actually we have a supplemental uh, program where we also provide money toward that and you can double dip, you can go to MET and you can go to us. And El Toro actually will pay for the entire conversion if it's deemed to be a cost effective project. So like I said, if you're interested in that, go talk to your respective agency, pick up our cards and we can chat with you uh, afterward. Okay. Who here has gotten a water device rebate? A water device rebate. Have you ever applied through Metropolitan for a rebate? Rebate? Okay, who is aware that the residential rebate process is different than the commercial rebate process? Did you find out the hard way? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so I'll, I was just gonna, this, I actually had this slide titled Commercial Rebates 101 because uh, so the residential rebates, you typically, you make sure that you buy an eligible product, you go out and purchase it, and then you submit your receipt and your water bill to MET, and then you just wait for the money to come in. It's a little different with commercial, and I want to explain that because we have a ton of really great commercial rebates that, you, that we want you guys to take advantage of, but I want to make sure that you apply correctly so that way you can take advantage of the incentive. So um, contractors, large commercial customers typically have, like, they buy in bulk. They just have bigger purchases. And so the system through Metropolitan is that you go to their website, which is SoCalWaterSmart.com. We actually have a rep here from Met2 if you have any questions about the, uh, the rebate program. And you make a reservation. And they do that because a lot of times you're not buying one or two toilets, you're buying 100 toilets. So they need to make sure that there's money available for you. You don't want to go out and buy 100 toilets and then ask for the rebate later because the money might not be there. Um, so make a reservation online. All you have to do is just tell Met how many devices you want to purchase and what type, and they'll make sure that the money is available. You'll get a notice to proceed, and at that point, you have 60 days to purchase and install the items that you made the reservation for. Once you're done doing the installation, then you can go back to the website and finish up the application. So just remember, if you're, if you're applying for a residential rebate, you can go ahead and make the purchase, apply later. If you're commercial, make the reservation first because we want to make sure that the funds are available. I don't think you'll have a problem with that in this area. We really like to make sure that the funding is available, but if you're working outside of these three agencies, just be aware that that could be an issue. So these are our great commercial uh, rebates. You guys are probably all familiar with the toilets and urinals. Those have been around forever. Uh, but did you also know we have rebates on ice machines for your community rooms? We have great rebates for stuff like that. And one of the things I wanted to highlight today is the outdoor uh, efficiency rebates. We have weather-based irrigation controllers, which I know we talked about a little bit earlier. We have a budget that basically tracks the weather and gives you a budget on a monthly basis based on how the weather changes. Well, we also have devices that will help irrigate that way also. And so it's very complementary to the budget structures that you guys are operating in in, this, in these areas. Um, high efficiency nozzles, they can, they can reduce your outdoor water consumption by 30%. Uh, we also have high efficiency rotors, cisterns, and soil moisture sensors that actually work in concert with the weather-based irrigation controllers. So even if your weather-based irrigation controller is telling your irrigation system to turn on, the soil moisture sensor can say, eh, we've got enough moisture and it'll delay irrigating. So if you're interested in those things or you have more questions about them, stop by some of the water efficiency or some of the water agency tables and we can explain it to you. Another big one, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is uh, commercial turf removal. All three agencies still have this available. The um, funding levels will vary. It does require a pre and post inspection. If you're applying in the Moulton Nagel service area, apply directly through our website because we manage the program internally. 
if you're applying through El Toro or for El Toro or Santa Margarita, uh, you'll have to go to the Municipal Water District of Orange County's website. But we still have that available. It's a great program. And thanks to a lot of HOAs like you guys, we've been able to take out 7.4 million square feet of turf. We'd like to see more of that non-functional turf get replaced and turned into drought-tolerant landscaping. Uh, we also have a spray to drip program. And again, the levels will vary. It does require the pre and post inspection, but it's something that you can do in concert with your turf removal program. So while you're out there exchanging the plant vegetation type, you know, exchange the irrigation. If you're not taking, if you're not making changes to the irrigation, it doesn't matter what type of plants you put in. Um, you know, you gotta, it, they kind of work hand in hand. And so we wanted to highlight Ocean Ranch HOA. It's a HOA in the Moulton Niguel service area. They've done a huge project um, at their site. And they're actually here in the audience today if you have questions for them later. And we also have a, a flyer of our case study of their project. But they have, um, they started noticing they were getting high water bills in 2010. And their landscaping committee uh, hired a consultant. And they made a very forward thinking, um, you know, commitment to transforming their landscapes. They had a lot of dead uh, acacia and they had some non-functional turf that they wanted to take out. But by the way, non-functional is nobody's using it. Only the gardener mows it. You know, nobody's using it. So why is it there? And so uh, they took out about 2.3 million square feet overall. A lot of that was dead shrubs. And, and now they have a beautiful pa uh, plant palette. You can go out there and see they've got agave and bougainvillea. It's colorful all year round. And that was some of the things that the residents were interested in. And so we actually got a chance to sit down and interview Howard Revere. He's the project champion and landscape committee chair. And we said, hey, Howard, what are the keys to your success? And basically, it was a forward-thinking landscape committee. They had great leadership. Um, they also had a project champion in Howard. You've got to have somebody when, when you know, kind of, tensions kind of rise and, and, and interest wanes that says, no, guys, we can do this. <laughs> and so they had somebody like that. They also had a very inclusive planning approach. They made sure that their community was kept up to date. And they included them on the, the plant palette selection. And they just made sure that communication was key throughout the process. And I want to show you the result of all their hard work. Um, we actually developed this yesterday. So you can see in 2010, they implemented their landscape transformation process. The blue line is a constructed budget prior to that. We didn't have it until 2011. But as you can see, they actually were exceeding their budget prior to 2010. And as we move closer and closer to today, they're actually consuming at half of their budget. So they're super efficient and their landscape is beautiful. So if you get a chance, drive through and check it out. I think you're all gonna like it. And we also, like I said, have a flyer. Um, if you want to take a look at it, uh, it'll be at the Moulton Nagel booth. And if I haven't convinced you yet, <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities to see what this looks like uh, in action. There's, I mean, a huge movement has started over the last five to 10 years because I think a lot of people have always thought, ah, oh, rocks and cactus, eh, I don't like that. But there's a, there's a huge variety of natives and a huge variety of drought tolerance and, of plants, and you can find them at these demonstration gardens. There's a beautiful one at El Toro Water District at their, at their headquarters if you want to check it out. We have some in the Moulton Nagel service area. Um, over at Saddleback College and the uh, Nagel, or excuse me, yep, Nagel Botanical Preserve. And, you know, usually they're free. You can just kind of walk through. And you can also see examples of microspray and more efficient irrigation systems, too. Okay, so here's kind of the meat and potatoes of this whole thing. I wanted to get to the best management practices. Um, but I wanted to give you some really interesting stuff before we get here. So, <laughs> um, so there's a lot of best management practices out there. But, you know, a lot of water agency people sit around in the room. We don't agree on much, but these are the things we do agree on. Um, so take regular meter reads, OK? You won't be able to track how much water you're using or if your usage is uh, out, like out of whack or if it's unnor or not normal if you don't take meter reads. Um, if you don't have advanced metering technology, it takes a second to just flip the lid, take your meter read, note it down, and then go to the next meter. Um, if you do have AMI, or like all of our potable and recycled water meters are on AMI, you can actually log into a portal and see hourly consumption. Um, you just need to track it. So make sure you're tracking it. You can't manage what you can't measure. Okay. Um, understand your outdoor budget equations. We kind of walk through what they're made of, several constants with the variation in ET. It's a little different for every agency. So if you're operating in other agencies, just give them a call. We love to talk about water. So just call us. We'll tell you all about it. Um, and utilize your ET resources. If you don't know what your ET was for the week, 
Um, we've got a nice app that you can go to our website, plug in where you live, and put in the date, and boom, there's your ET for the week. Um, and then there's other references, too. I believe El Toro uses Simis data. It's free. You just go online and say, I want this Simis station and for these dates, and there's your ET. Um, implement weather-based irrigation technology. We provide a rebate for it, um, and in a lot of cases, you can almost get them for free. So, and like I said, they help with maintaining your usage and keeping it kind of correlated to your budget, so it's always a good practice. Um, regular irrigation assessments. I can't stress this enough. If you're out there, run the stations. You know, look for, look for the geysers. You know, all it takes is turning it on, running it for one minute, and if you see Old Faithful on the other side of the back 40, that needs help. And so that's, those are some of the things we want to stress to people, you know, while you're out there, just run them. Um, and then a performance-based approach. This is mostly for HOA managers and actually being uh, managing our own landscape maintenance contract. I found this document very uh, helpful. This is on the um, MODOC website. It's a performance-based irrigation management contract template. The Irrigation Association also puts one out. But if you're looking to try to get more performance-based indicators into your contract to work with your landscapers, take a look at this. It's free. It's online. And actually, Matt from MODOC has a couple of copies here if you want to take a look at it. And then finally, I added these to myself because I like them. Look for opportunities to convert non-functional turf areas because you could see how the uh, Ocean Ranch HOA, they put in drought-tolerant plants and they're at half of their budget. They're not paying for any more than what they, uh, what they water. I mean, you don't have to water up to your budget, that 0.7 plant factor. You can put in 0.4 and just do half. That's water savings and money savings. And then finally, great communication. Um, I think after interviewing several HOA board members, we found that some of the best managed landscapes have the best communicating landscapers, property managers, and HOA board members. They make sure everybody's kept up to date, and they keep everybody in the loop. Um, another thing, HOAs, these are drought era policies that came out and are still in effect today, so I want to make sure that you guys are all aware of these because these are questions that we get from our homeowners quite a bit. Um, HOAs, you cannot prohibit drought tolerant landscape or the installation of artificial turf. If you've got CCNRs that act to restrict those, they are nullified by the California Civil Code. So just be aware of that. Like I said, we get a lot of phone calls. Um, and a lot of there may be some misinformation, so I just wanted to clear it up. It is still part of the California Civil Code. Also, if there are times where the governor or a local government declares a drought-related state of emergency, um, it is illegal to fine a homeowner who decides to not water their turf anymore or water their landscape. So just make sure that you're aware of the policies that are still in effect today. Uh, Kind of getting to the end of the slideshow, but I want to make sure you guys were aware that some of the agencies also offer commercial site visits where we can go out and help you um, identify leaks and just find opportunities to increase your efficiency. There's also free programs provided by Metropolitan Water District to do large landscape surveys, and those are for surveys of acreages of one acre or more. Um, just go to their website, bewaterwise.com, and you can sign up, and they give you a nice report, return on investment for all those water conservation measures, and um, you get that would be super helpful. Also includes all those rebates. Again, talking about the portal, um, you can pay your bills online. Every, every agency is different, so I don't want to speak for all of us, but for the Molten Nagel portal, you can pay your bills, you can view your current and past usage. If you have AMI, you'll soon be able to receive leak notifications. Um, and so get signed up for them. It's just an easy way to just get a notification on your phone or you know, an easy way to pay your bill from your phone. And it keeps it simple. For our landscapers in the room, um, we've all invested quite a bit in professional landscape training. We know that the look of the landscape is, training, you, or is changing. You can't take out seven and a half million square feet of turf, um, and that's just what we paid for. You know, there's the multiplier effect. We could have millions and millions of turf out there that's been converted without being educated on how to maintain those landscapes. And so there's tons of them out there. The Qualified Water Efficient Landscape Certification, that's being offered in Orange County currently. Um, another one that uh, Moulton has particularly tried to promote is the Watershed-Wise Landscape Professional Certification, and that's going to help you learn how to manage uh, runoff and keep it on site and do more of a watershed approach to design. And then finally, and we'll hear probably a little bit more about this later, the CMPS has a native plant specialist certification. And I think if you're landscaping in this area, you'll know that this is a hotbed for natives. And so if you know how to maintain natives, you're able to identify them and know about their water needs, it'll make your business a hotter commodity. I know it will for us. 
Um, and then finally, the CLIA, the Certified Landscape Irrigation Auditor. That just shows to anybody that's going to hire you that, you're, that you know how to do an irrigation assessment and that you've taken the steps to learn more about it. And so in the uh, spirit of partnership, today we're here with a lot of our cities and a couple of other water agencies. But as June mentioned earlier, we're also partnering with these same cities, a couple of local NGOs, OC Coast Keeper and Laguna Bluebell, as well as the county, um, to do our own help to um, try to mitigate runoff. You know, one of the reasons that we, that we start to do these programs is because we realize that dry weather runoff, which is the runoff that occurs when you're irrigating and goes down into the storm drain, we have a lot of information about that. We have meter level data that lets us know, hey, somebody's over irrigating. And so having that data and having these programs, which are very cost effective, we can work with all of our surrounding cities and NGOs to help implement programs that, uh, that reduce overwatering and avoid urban runoff. And so that's some of the stuff that we're trying to do through our partnership. Additionally, we work with OC Public Works, OC Code Lab, and the Data Collaborative, again, to try to use data to basically educate our customers. We're building an urban drool tool, which is about it's a nice, funny way of saying urban runoff, to let customers know, where is their runoff in my neighborhood and what can I do about it? And then finally, one thing to add is that we are all member or we are all agencies of the California Data Collaborative, which is a, is, is a statewide organization that is trying to basically use data, water data, um, to improve the public sector, to basically use that data to make things more efficient and to build programs that are more effective for you guys. And then in the spirit of collaboration, moving on again, we really want to work with you guys. We want to build sustainable communities. As Joe said earlier, if you've got outreach channels that you, know, that you need information for newsletters or if you've got your own portal, we send out an e-newsletter every month. We have paper newsletters. We've got tons of programs. So just let us know. Or if you have an event that you would like us to table at, just give us a call. Um, also, we would like to work with you guys to develop water-saving programs. I've always wanted to do a master valve and flow sensor pilot program, but I'm interested in your ideas too. So. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you listening to me. <laughs> we'll be available uh, during the break for one-on-ones, but we'll take a, a question or two if you have it, and I'll, I'll bring the mic just for purposes of the camera. Do you adjust your water budget formula? Um, from time to time, um, because it's based on a historical data, uh, I assume. And then, um, since we had a real hot December, mm -hmm. we went over our budget. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Santa Ana winds, we had above average temperatures, and so are you going to make some uh, considerations there? Um, so the the budget will change monthly with ET. It's not based. We don't we don't look back. I mean, this is I'm speaking from Molten. This is why it's important to make sure that if you have a question about your specific bill or your budget, that you you go to the the agency that you're working with. But for us, we do not use historical information. We're actually collecting real time weather data, and so we and and we have a microgrid. So we're trying to get the most accurate information as possible. And and yes, so that those it does take into consideration consideration aridity. We know that you know humidity is much lower during Santa Ana winds and so it will take that information into consideration. Other question? What about uh, the number of occupants in a home? Does that have any factor in the budgeting of water? Yes, we didn't oh yeah, we didn't discuss the indoor budget. Then it's, it's mostly a residential approach. Um, residents they actually have it it depends on your agency again. But yeah, you are generally allocated a certain gallons per day per person living in your home, and that's going to be your indoor budget. And we mostly just talked about the outdoor budget just to make sure that the irrigators in the room were familiar with it. But yes, it does factor into your indoor budget. And does there, is there any uh, impact on the sewer part of the, of the water bill? If you are in Molten Niguel Water District, yes, there is a per person uh, wastewater charge. So if you have four people living in your home, you'll get an allocation on the front end for your water supply, and then that'll also factor into your wastewater charge. Now, that is not, I don't know, I don't think that applies for the other agencies in the service area, but if you have very specific questions, I can follow up with you afterward. We'll do one more, and then we're going to go to our break so everyone can stretch their legs and grab some snacks out there. Several years ago, 
Metropolitan Water gave what we, we homeowners were invited to go on a tour. Mm -hmm. Oh, on a trip, on a tour of the water, the whole water system. I forget what that's called. The aqueduct. Uh, what was the aqueduct? All the way up to Sacramento. Well, we didn't go to Sacramento, but we went quite a ways up. It was a whole day. Oh, okay. Are you doing those anymore? Oh, I'm not from Metropolitan Water District. Okay, but are they doing them? Do you yeah, know? they are. In fact, they're here today. So if you want to check out their booth, you can ask them about upcoming tours. Thank you, guys. So we, a couple of things, then we'll take our break. Um, we still have a lot of great snacks and drinks out there, so please uh, uh, use them. Uh, the vendors, including presenters, will be available for questions. Um, we're going to come back. When we come back, uh, bring your raffle tickets because we have some great raffle uh, items. If you already don't have a raffle ticket at the welcome desk, you could still uh, get one. And uh, in addition to, to the presentations being made available online, we're going to put them on the Moulton and Water District website uh, with some time. Uh, and then also our district, like others, has a great Facebook page. And I know many of you are on Facebook, so make sure you like the Moulton and Water District on Facebook. Next, we're really uh, pleased to have somebody with some fantastic uh, academic background and, and real world experience. Uh, we have a presentation on integrated pest management. Uh, and we're pleased and honored to have Dr. Cheryl Willen. Uh, with us. She's the Area Integrated Pest Management Advisor for the UC Cooperative Extension. Welcome. Let's give the doctor a big round of applause. All right. Thanks. Okay. You have the remote. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it's really cool that um, there are pictures taken with that in the background because I got like free advertising. It's kind of like that the advertising behind home plate at the baseball game. So, that's really good. So, all right. So, um, I'm going to try and keep us on time, but I'm going to have time for questions, all right? So I might buzz through some of this stuff pretty quickly, but um, don't worry, we'll, we'll go through it. Um, so I was asked to talk about um, integrated pest management in relation to water quality, because that's what this meeting's really all about, is protecting their, our water resources. And, you know, it's all the water that, hap you know, what happens upstream at a watershed affects um, downstream here, a lot of stuff in Orange County, really, we're at the sort of the end of the watershed, as, as it were. And so, um, just to kind of let you know about integrated pest management, integrated pest management is one method that we can use. It's actually the preferred method um, across the, around the world for reducing impacts of pests, and then also, in the broader sense, um, managing how pesticides are used. And in some places, Pesticides are applied on a landscape situation, in our case here. You know, they're, they're picked up by irrigation water or rainfall or some, some other way that water moves and moves it, you know, into the, into the streets or the gutters. And then, you know, of course, that's not treated, as we all know, and then into the water bodies, okay? And so that's a big concern. So one of the things we do is try to work with people to... Um, essentially reduce their, their toxic pesticide footprint as it impacts water. So one of the things is that we have to keep in mind, if you're not from, well, first of all, just by a show of hands, how many people have ever heard of the term integrated pest management? Okay, that's pretty good. It looks like about half, half of the folks have. So, so what integrated pest management is, is just from the name. It's an in, it, you use a, a number of different methods to manage pests. And it's a very... Um, I, yeah, I hate to use the word holistic, but but really they know that's what it is. You're looking like at a whole whole system. That's interesting. I can see the presentation up there too, but it it's kind of weird to do that because <laughs> okay, so I might be going back and forth here. So uh, anyway, so what it is combination of methods, and we use in many times we use what's called a threshold, and the threshold is it could be anything you set that. Um, that you choose to say, okay, when I get close to this threshold, then I'm going to have to do something. It's just like if you have a kid and you say, if you do that one more time, I'm going to, you know, do something. I'm going to take away your toy. Or I guess now it's a PlayStation. And if you do that one more time, I'm going to take away your PlayStation. So it's the same thing. It's like if we reach cer a certain point, we're going to have to do something. So that's a threshold. But the key is that we want to try and do whatever we can to keep that pest below that threshold because then we don't have to do something because usually that something is to apply a pesticide. Yeah. Um, 
in the areas of insect pest management, now insecticides are what usually cause the water quality problems. Um, so we'll apply an insecticide on a plant, for example, here, and then if it's not applied appropriately, you know, perhaps that pesticide drips down, gets in the ground, um, we irrigate, a lot of the um, insecticides are somewhat water soluble, you know, again, they're picked up and they move into the gutter and so forth. So, um, so an alternative to pesticides is to use what we call beneficials, okay, those are parasites and predators, and they can help reduce the pesticides, or reduce the pests, and therefore you don't need pesticides. And most of them, they come in naturally, okay? Some of them we have to introduce, and there's a group of people at the, where I used to go to school at UC Riverside, there's a group of people that will travel all over the world to look for um, beneficial insects that are, uh, can, can control some of the pests that we have here. So I noticed on the Master Gardener table, you know, there's something for the Asian citrus psyllid, which is a really bad problem. Um, but one of my colleagues went over to Pakistan, found a beneficial insect that attacks, attacks the psyllid, and it, the hope is that it can sort of keep it at a low threshold that it doesn't move around too much and impact the citrus industry. So that's one of the things we work at. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you've all seen lady beetles, right? Um, they're, they're a predator. That's considered a beneficial because they'll eat aphids and whiteflies and so forth. Okay. The other thing about integrated pest management, again, is it's, it's a big system. It's ecosystem-based. So we don't just look at the pest right there. What we do is we look at how, what the stage of the plant is in, you know, what the stage of that pest is in. Um, do we have to do something right now or can we wait? Because maybe sometimes, uh, you know, sort of like one of the questions I usually get around um, November is people say, I have crabgrass in my lawn. I've got to really do something about that. And the reason people start noticing that crabgrass is because around November it starts turning purple. It's been in their lawn the whole summer, okay? And so what I tell them is like, don't do anything because it's going to die naturally on its own when it gets cold, okay? Because it grows, it's a warm season plant, okay? So those are the kinds of things that we look at when we are talking about integrated pest management. Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we can do to manage pests. Or, or, I'm sorry, these are um, things that can cause pest problems. So, um, over irrigation and under irrigation. So, I saw when I walked in, I saw um, just a slide that had, uh, you know, mathematical formula to determine how much water to apply, you know, based on evapotranspiration. And so, if you sort of go by sort of, oh, I know, know what to do, you know, many of you do, sometimes you get it wrong because you're basing that amount of water on the wrong kind of plant. So I noticed in the um, vendor's area, there's a lot of low water use plants. But if you're basing what you think, how much plant the water the plants need, you're probably gonna over irrigate. And a lot of those native plants, the low water use plants, obviously do not need a lot of irrigation, not a, not a lot of water, and you will be killing them, okay? So those are, that's sort of an issue, and that's a non-biotic issue. That's, that's not caused by a pest, that's you know, caused by um, dialytis. Okay, you're just turning that, that handle a little bit too much. Okay, I just made that up, thank you. Tra <laughs> trademark willing. Okay, um, okay, um, over fertilizing, that's another issue. Again, to just, just keep that in mind, sometimes under fertilizing. So it's a lot of times we often tell people and organizations, it's, you know, sometimes the best $30 you can spend is getting a soil test. You know, doing that, that maybe, you know, once a year, if you can't do that, every other year. That's really, really helpful, okay? But then we have these problems. There's nematodes. They're, they're microscopic worms that live in the soil generally. There's some that are foliar. You will not see them, but they can cause problems um, by sucking essentially on plant roots and, and making that plant not thrive very well. Insects, we're well familiar with those. Plant pathogens, that's what cause plant diseases, okay? Um, often incurable because once a plant has a disease, it's very difficult to get it to recover. So we have to do something that's preventative more. Um, weeds, my favorite thing, um, and that's often the biggest problem for many homeowners association, but um, even though they don't impact generally the growth of plants, and for most homeowners associations, the problem is an aesthetic issue. You know, you can't always have, you know, giant weeds growing up and say, well, you know, this is our sustainability program, okay? Some, sometimes your, your, your members don't care for that. Okay, and then uh, just talking to a gentleman. So we have vertebrate pests, and he, the first thing he asked me was, how do I control rabbits? Okay, it's a big, big, big issue because, you know, you just spent $30,000 planting those gazanias, and then 
The next day, you have gazania stumps, right? So that, that is a big issue, very, very economically impactful. <coughs> so um, integrated pest management. Key is prevention, okay? You have to do whatever you can to prevent the problem so you don't have to use a pesticide later on, okay? So, and there's ways to do that. Um, again, knowing about the pest, knowing about the biology. So for example, I just use that, that example of the rabbits, for example. Now, a lot of people don't want to do this because it's not economically viable, but the cottontail rabbits that we have here do not really burrow, okay? So if you've got a fence that you can, you know, bury about, you know, two or three inches deep, you know, they're not the type that's going to, like, like, really burrow underneath it. And on top of that, they don't jump more than about three feet. So, you know, if you have an area that you can kind of put a fence up that's about three feet tall, you've got that covered, right? Now, again, might not be economically feasible in many situations, but it's a um, good way to protect your, your valuable areas if you can, okay? Because you, cause you know something about the rabbit now, okay? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And one of the things about integrated pest management, it is a long-term program, okay? I used to get, um, you know, calls from people, and I would give this talk, okay? I give a talk just like this, and I'd say, this is how you manage it. You know, you have to do this, 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 and this, okay? You know, some cultural methods, some um, mechanical methods, you know, different, different ways. You know, and I said, you know, I said, you know, you do all these things, you know, you're, you're good because it'll manage the, that pest for the long term, okay? You're not going to be reactionary about it. And then I did the test. I'm like, oh, yeah, great job, Cheryl. And then the people raise their hand. What's the first question they ask? What's that? No, they ask, what do I spray? Yeah, <laughs> that's great, but what can I spray? And that's, that's, you know, that's not the point. It's like you, you can spray as part of that program, okay, you know, if you might need a little touch up here and there, but it's not the main part of the program. Okay, and there you go. That used to be the way. And, and I have to say, you know, probably a lot of, every, I, should, I, I don't want to put my finger at you, but, you know, I know people ha are, how people are. You see ants in your house, what's the first thing you do? Step on them? Well, good for you, yeah. But, you know, but, but a lot of people, that's a lot of stepping. That's a <laughs> <laughs> but most people, you know, they get that, that can of insecticide spray and they'll spray it, okay? Whereas, you know, a, a little bit of cleanup and then seeing where they come in, okay? So that's the long-term answer, seeing where they come in and then, you know, blocking that entrance to the house is really more of an IPM program, okay? And then when you do choose to use a pesticide, use the most specific one for that pest, okay? All right, so, so for example, okay? Now a lot of people don't like to see this, but this is really what it is. This is one of the best ways for a non-toxic method to control ground squirrels. It's actually a kill trap that you put right outside the, the burrow for a ground squirrel, okay? Because they've got to go through it to get out of their, their burrow, okay? Um, this, here is a very um, specific way to apply a herbicide. A herbicide is a pesticide used to kill plants. You notice I don't say kill weeds. I mean, that's the outcome of it, but, you know, weeds are plants, right? And so, I, I mean, just to give you an example, is I had somebody a few years ago call up, and she said, I bought this stuff. It says it kills weeds, you know, kills all weeds. And so I sprayed it around my rose bushes, and my rose bushes died. Why is that? It said it was going to kill weeds. And I'm like, ah, you know, weeds are, you know, it kills plants, you know. It just so happens that, you know, it wasn't safe to use around your rose bush. So, you know, just keep that in mind, of course. But this is a very specific way right here. So here's an X, and you, you know, make a little, what they call a frill in there, and you can just spray that herbicide right there. There's no exposure to um, everybody else, and it, you know, you would use a translocated herbicide, moves through the tree, and kills it. So we use that technique a lot for invasive woody plants. Anybody know what this is? This little thing here? It's a bug? Well, close. Okay. Anybody else? Ladybug, what stage? Larva. Okay. So this is what, what somebody, <laughs> it's actually very funny. I gave a talk like this a couple days ago, and she said, that's the teenager stage of a ladybug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's like, it's great. So this will metamorphosize into our well-known um, red ladybug, but if you don't know that, you think it's a problem because it's all over your plants, but it's actually eating um, aphids and whiteflies and other insects that are problematic. Okay, so I'm just going to go from here. 
Okay, so those are the things we like to look at for an integrated pest management program. You know, we want to prevent it. We want to look at cultural practices that we can do. Um, we want to look at physical methods. Physical method would be something like mulch for weeds. Incredible way to manage weeds, low impact. Also very sustainable because you're taking something that would normally go to a landfill and actually using it for a good purpose. Um, we already talked about biocontrol. And then again, so I just want to make it clear, as part of an integrated pest management program, pesticides are used, but they're used very judiciously. Okay. All right. So when are pesticides used? When pests are causing intolerable damage. That's your threshold. Okay. So that's, that's when, you, when you would do that. Okay, when you try everything or trying them in concert, you might say, well, you know, I, I, I did everything I could, so now I'm going to have to just sort of get back to, to a baseline or an area where I can manage these pests below the threshold, so I'm going to be using a pesticide in that case. Good. All right. Key, identify what the pest is. Because you don't know what it is, you don't know how to control it. Just like when you go to a medical doctor, and if you say, hey, doctor, you know, I have, a, you know, a swelling here on my arm, okay, the doctor is not just going to say, well, hopefully not just going to say, just put some ice on it, take some aspirin, okay? They're going to, you know, perhaps take x-rays, make sure it's not broken, you know, they might be doing something else, they might, you know, touch it and so forth, see if it's inflamed. So they're doing a lot of other things because they don't want to tell you, you know, the wrong thing because they'll, it'll come back to bite them in the butt later on. Okay, same here. You want to know what you have. So, for example, I mean, this is just, just something that happens a um, little bit frequently, not too frequently. There's a grass that we have in Southern California called Kikuyu grass. Very common. Looks like uh, Bermuda grass on steroids, essentially. But the way that it produces its seeds, okay, so it's got this pollen that com comes up on these little white filaments, okay, and in a nice moist, um, um, environment, you know, like, like this morning, you know, it was kind of overcast and it was cool. It, you know, those white filaments in a field that has kikuyu grass looks like that grass is coated with fungus. Okay. So somebody that doesn't really know that might say, oh, you know, I've got this, this disease problem on my turf. I better spray that with a fungicide. Okay. So those are the kinds of things we have to know. Is it the way the plant grows or is it, you know, a real pest? Because you don't want to have a pesticide go into the environment if it's not needed. Okay and then also see how bad it is. And, and then, again, know what you got. Okay, we have a really good website I'll talk about in a second, but just keep this in mind. Again, focus on water quality, if, if nothing else, is to just use the pesticides when, when you know, the other things that you're using might not be working or if it's part of your program. Okay? A lot of times we use pre-emergent herbicides. Those are the herbicides that you would use um, to kill a weed before it emerges from the soil, you know, that actually can go a long way in preventing weeds that you don't have to apply a post-emergent herbicide. So, so they're part of the, um, or you can use them in concert with mulches, so it makes the mulches work that much better. So it's not like you use, use the pesticides as a last resort, they're used as in concert with the other um, methods. Okay, so let's go to water quality. Um, because I didn't see the beginning of the presentations, I don't know if anybody, has this been covered already? You know the no okay, okay so so yeah so we have pesticides. Pesticides again can be very helpful as long as they are applied where they're supposed to be applied. But once they move off site, okay, um, then they can cause some problems. Okay, so what happens is the pesticide you know can kill things at the the bottom of the food chain. Okay, this phytoplankton for example. We usually have um, this type of problem can happen with certain herbicides and generally we have it happen with some insect, most insecticides actually. Um, so then, then that's the base and of course, you know, it, what happens, it does, sometimes it doesn't, you know, kill, you know, we've, we've heard about accumulation like with DDT, right, so that's accumulated in each, each species as it feeds on that. So sometimes we have that but in many cases we don't really have accumulation but when there's just less for each stage to eat, you know, then you have less of, of the above um, feeding groups also, okay? So that, that's one of the problems there, okay? The other problem is that off-site use of pesticides, you know, oh, I didn't know that kid moved. Okay, <laughs> I guess I just never noticed that. Um, you know, so, so children, 
are more impacted by pesticides than adults because they have a higher skin to body ratio and and you know their their skin's not hardened you know like like ours is and so they could you know the exposure to pesticide has a bigger impact on children pets you know they'll eat anything so you know we always have to be careful with that you know if there's a, a you know you're, you're taking your dog around you don't want them to be licking up um molluscicide, you know, the pesticide used to kill snails, for example. Um, of course, if you're using a pesticide that we call is a broad spectrum pesticide that's made to kill just about every insect, you're also going to kill your beneficials. Then you're going to lose that, that method that you're using to control the pests. And then this is just an example of a herbicide drift. So I might have applied a herbicide, you know, over here, you know, that's safe on my landscape plant but my tomatoes in my garden are growing over here and a gust of wind came up, you know, and hit those tomatoes. So that's, a, that's drift, and so we don't want that either. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so then the reason we're all concerned about this is because we all live in a watershed, right? Okay, and what happens in a watershed affects everybody. So, you know, we're living in a community, we're, we're sharing this watershed, and so, a lot of stuff that happens upstream affects what happens downstream, okay? And usually downstream gets all the accumulation. So, you know, so a lot of people, I've seen this in my own neighborhood, says, ah, you know what, I can dump paint in the gutter, you know, because it's going to be diluted, you know, by the time it gets, you know, down to the ocean. And I'm like, you know, so what, right? You know, it's still paint in the gutter that's going down to the ocean. So, you know, we all have to keep it in mind because that guy might say, yeah, I'm putting paint here, I'm the only one. Meanwhile, you know, four people down the rest of my neighborhood is all, are also dumping paint and saying the same thing. So we have to watch that, obviously. Okay, so this is just, I mean, actually, this is something that I've, I've observed. This is a herbicide that was applied for this turf here. And so a lot of times with belly grinders, right, you know, it's, it's hard to control. So, so they were applying this herbicide on the turf here as a granule. And so it ends up here. This is very easy to be picked up by irrigation water and moved into the gutter again, into the waterways. And so in this case, what the applicator should have done after seeing this is actually sweep it up, okay? Or if they're gonna use a blower, blow it back onto the grass. Don't blow it into the street. Those are the kinds of things we wanna watch out for. Okay. And they get into the waterways, okay, here we are, it's washed off, there's a person you know, applying there. Let's say that's irrigated, goes right in the street, okay? Right, and then it goes right, right directly untreated, okay? We always have to keep that in mind. It's not treated, okay? And so these are the kinds of conditions where we could have where, where things run off into the water. Um, over irrigation, I cannot stress enough how important managing irrigation, not only how much, but where it goes, okay? And it's very, very important. I often see this. This is a problem here. I, mean, I don't have a picture. But see here, this drains right here. Often big turf areas have a drain in the turf, okay? And then the applicator will just go right over that and just apply that pesticide. will go right into the drain, okay? So <clears throat> I'm just going to go through this pretty I'm almost done here. Okay. So again, just want to be, be clear about why it's important that people practice integrated pest management um, in, the, in the context of water quality, okay? Because what, what you do will really impact where the pesticides are gonna go. Um, and so we do have pesticides in some cases are contributing to water quality issues in Orange County, okay? I just, so one of the places where you can get information, this is our website, ipm.ucanr.edu, okay? Um, we have this really great, you can just click on these depending on what type of pest you have, um, all kinds of information about pests and pesticides and cultural and non-chemical non methods. So we have sort of a whole integrated pest management program for each type of pest as it were. Okay, so um, I think I have just like a couple minutes for questions here. <coughs> Let's have you on the mic so that the camera can listen. Um, decolate snails, do you recommend those? So, okay, so the question, I guess you heard it. Decolate snails are, are a, um, it's a biocontrol, okay? So these are these snails that are essentially carnivorous and they will eat other snails. And they'll also eat plants, by the way. And so in some cases, they're, they're helpful if you have a low population of brown snail. You know, they, they're actually pretty good and the snails are young. 
the caveat to that is number one, they're kind of hard to get now. If you have a good population, okay, you're, you're in good shape. The, the caveat, the big caveat is that they don't care what kind of snail they, they eat. And so we have actually a lot of native snails around here. And so they will go to those native snails um, and consume them. And, and actually some of those snails are, are somewhat rare. And so we're, there is some cases where we're, we're losing some rare endemic snails in California. So if you are close to a wildland area at all, because they can be picked up in water as well quite easily, you know, be very, very careful if you choose to use them. Let's take uh, w w one or two more, and then sh she'll be available also after the workshop. Besides mechanical, uh, mechanical control, uh, what's a good substitute for glyphosate? So that's a really good question because I get that a lot, and a lot of cities are, you know, they're under some pressure from some, some community groups to say, oh, no glyphosate. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to say that there's a lot of, if you're just looking for something that's a translocated herbicide, which is what makes glyphosate so special, you know, there, there are alternatives, okay? So if you're trying to control grasses, you can use um, something like, I, I, I'll give you the chemical name because I can't remember the actual names off the top of my head. So you can look at it on the active ingredient label, um, part of the label, but something that's got fluazifop in it or cethoxidim in it. So sorry, you know, I have to use those names. I think one of them is named like grass getter or something like that. So that'll, that's translocated through grasses, okay? You know, if you want to kill broadleaves, you know, there's, there's herbicides like that. So something like triclopyr, for example, kills broadleaf plants, but doesn't hurt most um, grasses. So there are options for that, okay? But if um, there's, and the I guess the closest thing to glyphosate that's sort of non-selective is um, a material, I think it's called a leopard, is the, the common name of it. it. It's only available for professional landscapers though, okay? Um, but if you're looking for organic substitute for glyphosate, there is none. There's no organics that are translocated. Okay, so you know, just keep that in mind if you're doing a change. Okay, sir. Is the uh, ladybug a good uh, a good um, is is that effective against the citrus problem? Okay, so so the ladybug generally is not very effective on that, but it, it could be. There's another biocontrol that, that works much better for the um, Asian citrus psyllid. But, but, but you know, ladybugs are, are what we call general predators, so if it encounters one, one of the psyllids, it'll probably, you know, munch on it for there. But, you know, it's not going to give you like a big, big, big impact on management of it. You know, the, the actual management, you have to really control pretty much 90% or more of that insect because only one is a, you only need one to transmit the, the pathogen, the virus that causes the citrus greening. So you really need to be very, very vigilant in controlling those. Okay. Let's okay. give the Great. doctor Great. a big round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Weiland. Thank you. <laughs> the next uh, presenter uh, came from far away to come talk to you all. So it's fantastic that, that, that she came out. She actually is, is based out of Sacramento, and uh, Kristen uh, Wernick is with the California Native Plant Society. They also help with some of the raffles, so, so thank you. Uh, but we're really uh, pleased to have her here to talk about uh, native plants and her organization. So let's give Kristen a round of applause. Hi, uh, my name is Kristen Warnick. I am the Outreach Coordinator for the California Native Plant Society. How many people have heard of California Native Plant Society? A decent amount, okay, that's good. Um, so for those of you who haven't, we are a statewide nonprofit organization. We have about 35 chapters statewide and almost 10,000 members. Um, so we're a pretty big organization. Um, and here at CMPS, we really do believe that we can restore nature one garden at a time, and that our built landscapes have a really big impact on our ecosystems. So of course we're all here today to talk about water use efficiency in our landscaping, but I do want to remind us that California is special. Um, and I think a lot of us can agree that we really love where we live. <laughs> we get the beach right down the road, we can go to the mountains within the same day if we wanted. And with all that special diversity, um, it leads us to this point that we have more native plant species in our state than any other state in the nation. 
Um, and it also brings us to this point that California is actually a biodiversity hotspot. A third of our plants are endemic to our state, which means that they are found nowhere else in the world. Um, and to be a biodiversity hotspot, not only do you have to have a really high level of species richness, but you also have to have lost 70% of your native habitat. So unfortunately, we have all this great diversity, but we've also lost quite a bit of it due to development and other things like that. The great thing, though, is that all of us in this room, we are decision makers. We have a direct impact on what's planted in our landscapes, and we can reverse that trend, and we can actually support this really rich biodiversity that we enjoy um, as Californians. And at the base of all that are our native plants. Native plants are the foundations of our ecosystems. They are the basis of our food webs upon which all life depends. Um, and recently at our uh, conservation conference um, a couple months ago, we had a noted ecologist, uh, entomologist from the East Coast come and talk. He's done a lot of studies um, and over two decades of research on um, insect and plant relationships. Um, did you know that 90% of insects can only eat the plants with which they've co-evolved? So one of the big um, kind of showy, you know, easy to, to remember ones is milkweed and monarchs, right? We've all heard about monarch butterflies needing milkweed in order to survive and to reproduce. Um, well, 90% of our insects are in that same boat. So in order to have insects, and in order, in order to have birds and all the other creatures we enjoy, we need to have insects. Caterpillars are the primary food source for baby birds. So without our caterpillars and our insects, we don't have all the levels of the food web. So what we plant really matters. I think that's going to be the biggest takeaway from this, is that what we do as decision makers is really important. Um, and we worked with Molten Nigel to produce um, these maps that show the footprint of HOAs and cities here in the Molten Nigel service area. So Molten Nigel has, I think, 400 HOAs in their service area, and about 75% of their customers are in an HOA service area. Um, so the first map shows the HOA footprint. The second map shows the residential homes that are also either in an HOA or they're um, under a city CCNR or city rules and whatnot. So it's a pretty big footprint. That's a huge area that all of us in this room are responsible for. We make the decisions on what's planted in you know, the landscapes we see in our, in our streetscapes, in our um, common areas, and we also make the decisions on what plants homeowners can and can't put in their front yards. So we have a lot of influence over a very large area. So real quickly, um, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the lessons we've learned, especially over this last drought. We've seen a lot of drought tolerant landscapes go in, but we've also noticed that a lot of them aren't solving our problems. Um, so of course, grass, non-recreational non turf, um, it's water guzzling, it produces a lot of, um, there's a lot of inputs for fertilizers and whatnot that all end up in our waterways, um, so that's not a good solution. We also know that letting this go brown <laughs> is not a good solution either, right? It doesn't help our community aesthetics. Um, it doesn't help our wildlife. Um, so neither of those are good solutions. How about this? How many of us have seen this in our HOAs? <laughs> yeah. Um, so of course, zero water, right? Um, zero maintenance. However, there's also zero aesthetics with this. And we know that's not a solution for our for our um, properties, and especially doesn't help our property values in our communities. And that's very important to us as homeowners and people on, on our boards. Um, it also doesn't help our watershed, it doesn't provide any health or benefits for the soil, and it certainly doesn't provide any habitat. And especially underneath all that mulch was a big layer of weed cloth, which also inhibits the recycling of nutri nutrients from the mulch decomposing to help feed the soil. So none of that's happening in this landscape either. How about this? <laughs> We've seen this quite a bit. <laughs> um, who thinks that we live in a desert climate? Okay, good. Okay, we're starting to learn. So California is actually a Mediterranean climate. And I'm not going to go too much into this because the next speaker, Jody, is going to talk quite a bit about it. Um, but I do want to clarify that we do not live in a desert. We live in a Mediterranean climate. And of course, desert landscapes can have their place. They can look aesthetically nice and everything. But a lot of us are kind of afraid of this because you know what happens is that concept of zero maintenance um, ends up looking like this. So again, zero aesthetics, not good for the watershed, not good for the soil. There's no mulch on there, um, providing no habitat. How about this? We've got synthetic turf in the middle. We've got a mix of plants. We've got some aloe, a bunch of weeds in the front, another layer of weed cloth with the weeds growing through the weed cloth. Um, we've got palm trees, just kind of a hodgepodge. Uh, but still considered by many a drought-tolerant landscape. Um, 
How about the synthetic turf? Does anyone know how hot synthetic turf can get in the hot sun? <laughs> Has anyone experienced it? I've seen it melt. It can get up to 170 degrees sitting in the hot sun. And on top of that, um, so, so then essentially people have to water it to cool it off to be able to walk on it if their kids or their pets or whatever want to use it. Um, on top of that, it's not biodegradable. There's a lot of chemicals used in producing it. Um, it ends up back in our landfills, polluting our waterways and everything. So let's agree, no more synthetic turf. <laughs> Um, okay, and finally, invasives. We see this plant everywhere, Mexican feather grass. Um, this is a home where I think they just wanted to plant a few around the seating area up behind the tree, and it completely took over. It's all over the place, and it's all over the neighbors nearby. It's in the street. It's growing up in the cracks in the concrete. The sad thing is, um, right next door to it, on the other side of the street, there's a brand new house up for sale, and guess what's planted there? There's like 30 new plantings of Mexican feather grass. So on top of it being an invasive plant that's causing a maintenance headache for all of us, we're also setting a really bad example for other people who are doing landscaping projects. Um, on top of that, over $80 million are spent every year in California removing invasive plants. So if we weren't to plant them in the first place, we would all save ourselves a lot of taxpayer money so, and headaches. So essentially what we're seeing is that we must raise the bar for what we're asking our landscapes to do. Um, worldwide, we've already degraded 60% of our ecosystem services. So our built landscapes are really becoming the places for conservation and for pollinator and habitat. We have, to, we have to ask our landscapes to support life. They need to sequester carbon. They need to clean and manage water. They need to enrich soil and support soil biology. And they need to support pollinators. Because without our landscapes and without our ecosystem services, we can't exist either. So essentially, we have a new criteria for choosing our landscapes. Um, traditionally, landscaping, landscape design, especially if any of you have done like landscape design or architect classes, they're really focused on decorative value and screens and focal points and color and um, you know the color wheel and anchor points. But those those can't be our main those can't be the main things that we're using for design anymore. We have other important things that we need to balance that out with. Of course, these are still important, and we still have to have aesthetics in our landscapes. But we have to balance it with things like food web value and watershed value and um, soil health. So this was kind of a fun um, slide. Essentially, um, this is what a bird would see when it's looking at your landscape. <laughs> So they're not just seeing plants. They're not just seeing a tree or a shrub or a lavender or whatever. They're seeing food. So if we're not planting plants that the birds can eat, they're not seeing anything. Um, so basically, our, our landscapes are foraging hubs. They are places where these creatures come for food and, and come for, for their habitat. And the good thing is that our California native plants can solve all these problems that we just talked about. Um, in a study, it was a nine-year case study done by the city of Santa Monica. Um, two plots, two front yards. Um, they did a traditional you know, grass landscape with the shrubs around the house, that kind of thing. The other one was 100% native landscape. From that study, 80, the native landscape used 83% less water. It produced 56% less green waste and required 68% less maintenance. So native landscapes really do excel at water efficiency and fill all of the other criteria that we're looking for. Now, I hear it all the time. Natives look weedy. Um, you know, they're hard to maintain. They're hard to water. There's so many issues with them. So I want to talk about a few things that you can do to be successful with native plants. Because it's really not that hard. It's a little bit different than our traditional ways of landscaping. But it's not really that much harder. And it'll actually be easier in the long run. So the first thing you can do is plan for rain. Design for rainwater capture. We need to be designing our landscapes to, to, um, to capture the rain and, and infiltrate it into our soil, because that's what our plants need to survive on throughout the year. Um, and it also prevents runoff and pollutants from entering our waterways and our watershed. Planting in the fall is huge. That's when you know the temperatures are starting, usually, to cool off. Um, we get our winter rains, hopefully. Um, and that's the best time to establish a native plant landscape. Um, it can be done in the spring, or I would hate to say the summer, but it can be done, but it's very difficult. You're going to have the most success if you plant in the fall. Water deeply and infrequently. This is really important, especially when you're establishing a native plant garden, um, to water deeply to really get those roots to go down and spread far so that they can find their own sources of water when we do have times of drought or you know, low water, low rainfall. 
um, and avoiding regular summer watering. So a lot of our native plants don't like water in the summertime. Um, think about our climate. Do we typically get a lot of rain in our summer? No, right? So most of our native plants will actually, you'll do more harm than good by watering them in the summertime, which is good for us because it means we can save more water. Okay, planting local. So this is a really big one. Um, so not only planting a native plant, but planting a locally native plant. So what I mean by that is there's, you know, in California we have over 7,000 species of native plants, um, going back to us having the most native plants in the nation. Um, so we have endless possibilities and <laughs> options when it comes to choosing plants. But planting the ones that are locally native are going to be the best plants for your landscape because they're adapted to the specific climate conditions of your location. So they're going to require the least amount of additional irrigation. They're going to be the best plants for supporting habitat, providing food and nectar. Um, and, and they're adapted to the temperature and you know, the, the, the wind and all that kind of stuff. So, and of course, don't plant an invasive. Again, <laughs> please, no more Mexican feather grass. <laughs> um, Plantright.org. Who's heard of Plantright.org? Anybody? A few people. So they're a really great organization. They're also, I think they're a nonprofit as well. Um, everybody write that down, plantright.org. They're a great resource. Um, you can go on there and learn about, you know, kind of what are the really common invasive plants, especially ones that are still available in nurseries that you might not realize. Um, they work very closely with nurseries to make sure those plants are either not in production or coming out of production. Um, and they have a lot of great plant alternatives on there, so you can see what to plant instead of that invasive plant. Okay, and planting for success. So this is huge with native plants. Um, hydrozoning, does, it, does everybody know what hydrozone means? Have we heard that term, a few of us? So basically that means planting plants with the same water needs um, on the same irrigation station or zone, okay? So here's an example of that. Um, <laughs> this is, um, I saw this just a couple of weeks ago actually. Um, all those succulents in the middle, which are non-native, um, and actually the red one, that fire stick plant is like really poisonous, so make sure you're not planting that in your, especially your common areas. Um, but anyway, so those are all low water use plants in the middle of high water use turf. So that's gonna be really unsuccessful because whether you're trying, if you're trying to irrigate for the succulents, you're gonna do low water use, right? Well then the, the, the grass is gonna suffer. If you try and irrigate for the grass, then the succulents are gonna get overwatered and they're gonna suffer. So this is not a winning solution. Over here on the other side, however, we have um, California penstemon, um, penstemon spectabilis, the purple plant there, which is a California native. And then right below it, we have blackfoot daisy, which I believe is native to Texas, in the southwest region in general, but not specifically to California. However, these plants, even though one's native and one's not, they have the same water requirements. And so they, if they're planted together, they're both gonna be successful. You're gonna have a successful landscape with that and be water efficient while you're doing it. Um, so going back to this, so planting the right plant in the right place, paying attention to the sun and the shade and the soil type that it needs. Um, planting local and evergreen foundation plants. This is a big one because a lot of California native landscapes that I see go in use a lot of perennials or annuals and there's quick blooms and then all of a sudden all that goes away and it looks like this kind of bare, kind of you know weedy landscape. So planting evergreen foundation plants is really important because it provides that structure and that year-round interest and color to keep the landscape looking good. And spacing for mature growth, do pay attention to the plant labels. If it says it gets 10 by 12, it will get 10 by 12. <laughs> so do pay attention to that as well. Skip that one. Okay. And plan for low maintenance. Um, you know, going back to this picture again of, you know, we're not planning for zero maintenance because that means we have zero, um, we have zero habitat, we have zero benefits essentially. So we do need to plan for low maintenance. And when we follow all these things that we talked about, we can have beautiful California native landscapes that are low maintenance. And this is another really important thing. I know for a lot of HOAs, we're really focused on um, you know, aesthetics, right? And having these certain, um, like even categories of aesthetics. Like I have a you know, bungalow style home and I have to have this type of a design for my landscape. And some of that's even built into the rules for HOAs. Well, the great thing about native plants and with over 7,000 species, um, you can create any design aesthetic or style using California native plants. So you can create a Mediterranean style garden using California native plants. You can create even a Japanese or a contemporary garden using California native plants. 
When it comes to these different styles, a lot of it really depends on the hardscaping and uh, the layout and, and, and the plant selection, you know, selecting plants with certain structures or colors. Um, but California native plants are very versatile, so you really can't accomplish all your goals. So I wanted to talk real quickly um, about some plants to use instead, some common ones we see all the time. So we all know the tree on the left, um, crepe myrtle, right? We see the crepe myrtles all over the place. Does anyone know the tree on the right? <laughs> no, uh, have one person in the back that knows it. <laughs> yes, it's the western redbud. Trees look almost identical, don't they? They're very similar. So, but the redbud is our California native plant, um, and it acts very similarly similarly to the crepe myrtle. It's low water. It's deciduous, so it produces beautiful fall color. Um, in the springtime, it's one of the early spring bloomers, so it'll bloom in like February, March, and all the pink flowers bloom actually on the branches. So it's beautiful because, you know, the branches just light up in this bright pink, um, and then it produces these really big heart-shaped leaves. So a really cool tree. So instead of using our, instead of the traditional crepe myrtle, let's use our western red, but it's a native plant. It's an important habitat plant. Um, down here, again, on the left under shrubs. Um, <laughs> so this I took recently as well. That was a hedge of Indian hawthorn, or raphiolepis, one we're all pretty familiar with. It got overtaken by ivy, so there's ivy growing all over it. Um, so that's not working. And then in the middle are crepe myrtles growing. Um, you can see the, the tree trunks there. Um, so again, instead of these kind of ugly and um, you know, non-working, not, not aesthetic landscapes, let's try some of our natives. So some good alternatives are buckwheat and ribes, manzanita, lemonade berry, toyon, and coffee berry. Um, the buckwheat is what you see pictured behind there. Um, I've actually heard from quite a few landscape designers now that they recommend buckwheat over iceberg roses. Um, and a lot of their clients are really happy about it because it blooms longer, um, it provides more habitat, um, it produces really beautiful fall color, and it's a more profuse bloomer than the iceberg roses are. Um, and it's super hardy. I mean, this thing, buckwheat just grows like crazy, so it's a great plant. Um, so for perennials, you know, we're used to lavender, we're used to daylilies and gazanias, kangaroo paws, one we see all the time, butterfly bush. Um, but we have a lot of natives that mirror all of that. So instead of lavender, there's a ton of sages that we can be planting. Um, instead of daylily, Douglas iris is a beautiful alternative. Um, down here under ground covers, so we see carissa or natal plum all the time, right? Um, myoporum, rosemary, those are some other really common ones. Over here on the right, um, so that is a photo in Newport Beach. They planted, it's on, I think, Newport Beach Boulevard. It's, it's the main highway into Newport Beach. Um, that entire planting all the way down, all that green that you see, that's all California lilac. It's all California native plant. It's a beautiful, successful planting, mass planting of it. Um, and you can see it's starting to bloom with the purple flowers there. That whole, that whole strip is going to be... Um, just like a cloud of purple in the next couple weeks here. Um, so on a really highly visible, on a really high-end area of Orange County, we've got California lilac all down the highway planted, you know, and growing successfully. Um, so there's tons of options. Essentially what I'm trying to say is there are a lot of options out there for us um, when it comes to planting natives over non-native species. Um, succulents as well. Has anyone heard of the Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Garden? Yeah, few people. <laughs> um, it's a beautiful garden out in Claremont. Highly recommend you go. I was just there a couple days ago, um, and they had a mass planting of um, our native succulents, which are called Dudleyas. So most of the succulents that you see at the store, at Home Depot, or even at the grocery store nowadays, they're not native to California. We do have one species or one family of succulents that are native, and they are called the Dudleyas. Um, and you really can do mass plantings, just like we see the blue chalk sticks with our native Dudleyas. Um, same with grasses. Again, no more Mexican feather grass. <laughs> um, we've got tons of other options. Purple three on deer grass is a common one that people are starting to use a lot. So this is a really exciting story I wanted to share with you guys. Um, okay, so in Florida, uh, this plant is called Kunti. Um, in the early 1900s, it was completely eliminated from the wild because of the starch industry. I guess it's really high in starch. So this butterfly, called the Atala butterfly, relies on that plant for all of its reproductive cycle. The caterpillar needs that plant to eat and to reproduce and create, you know, the Atala butterfly. 
So essentially, the butterfly went extinct. They tried to put it on the endangered species list. They couldn't find any remaining populations and had to list it as extinct. Well, then a couple years ago, landscapers realized, oh, Kunti's kind of a cool plant. It you know, actually behaves really well in our landscape with our sandy soils. Um, it's evergreen, and they started planting it all over in their cityscapes, in their landscapes, um, in their common areas. The Atala butterfly came back, and it's thriving. It's not even on the endangered species list. They completely revived this population without even trying. So it really just goes to show you how much power we really do have and how much our landscapes really do um, impact our ecosystems. Oops. So anyway, um, so yeah, we have a lot of power and a lot of influence with our decisions that we can make. We have a lot of resources available. Um, so if you're ever looking for native plants, I think all of you got a flyer today for calscape.org. It's a native plant online database that we have. You can also search for nurseries on there. So when you're looking for plants for your projects, you can find which nurseries are carrying which plants. They have their inventories loaded on there. Um, a lot of you have come by and picked up our planting guide. This is specific to Orange County. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's my name up there, Kristen Wernick. If you ever have any questions or you want any guidance on any of your projects, please reach out to us. Um, our Orange County chapter is a phenomenal resource and Tree of Life Nursery down the street is another phenomenal resource for you guys. So. Let's give Kristen a big round of applause. Yeah. I know many of you interacted already with her in, in, in the break room. And you know, to get you all out at a decent time, uh, we're going to move on directly to, to the next speaker. But uh, we're very appreciative you came down all the way from Sacramento. And it was very informative. And the resource that you listed at the end is also uh, fantastic. And she'll be uh, with us uh, after the workshop as well if you want to ask her more questions. Next, uh, kind of to continue in the same uh, line of thinking, uh, we have a presentation on horticulture and landscape best management practices. And we're pleased to have uh, with us Jody Cook. She's the owner and project manager at My Avant Garden. Welcome. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. And to be honest, a lot of what was just said, I'm essentially going to recap. Um, so, uh, but I think what I might serve to do is to frame it in a way that you can kind of use and kind of hang on to whenever you make decisions in your own landscape. So the frame that I'm going to talk about is called the watershed approach. And that really encompasses, it, encompasses everything you've heard today. It is a sustainable garden. That's the bottom line. And the University of California would describe sustainable as the ability to do something in your landscapes, inputs, inputs into your landscapes that have minimal impact on the environment. But when we utilize the watershed approach and when we utilize the techniques we've talked about today, it actually goes beyond that. You start to build places that feed and water themselves. They start to take care of their own pest control. We need people to maintain them. We need to, be, to sort of be the benevolent overlords, making sure that nothing goes awry. But you will find that as you start to implement all of these different aspects, your landscapes will be not only more beautiful for you, but they will, be more, um, they will offer more ecosystem services as well. So all over California, there are cities and municipalities that are implementing sustainability models and regenerative spaces. But cities and municipalities are very large, and their efforts can be very dispersed and spread out. And there are homeowners that are establishing sustainable gardens and native gardens. But you need to map up a lot of individual homeowners in order to really make a difference to our watershed. But you are the sweet spot of sustainability. You own thousands of contiguous acres in Orange County. And so not only when you start to implement these sustainable practices can you start to impact your neighborhoods, but you can have very quickly a massive impact. Within 10 years, you could literally change the face of Orange County if you implement all of these uh, guidelines and recommendations. So the watershed approach is six steps. It's simple, but they cannot be cherry-picked. You can't pull one out and decide that you're going to go water-wise, but you're not going to take care of your soil. Or you're going to use IPM, but you're going to continue to plant 
uh, the kinds of plants that you've always planted in the way you've always planted them. You have to use each one. So I'm going to run through each of them right now and it really sums up what we've talked about today. So the first one is landscaping with our climate. Kristen talked about the fact that we're, with a we're in a Mediterranean climate, but guess what? You'd never know it by watching our landscape practices. We don't look like we are and I'm going to show that very explicitly to you. We're going to talk about building living soil. Soil is alive. We need to learn to test for biology and for chemistry. I'm going to talk about that too. Rainwater is not a waste product, right? It's not something we should watch shoot down our streets. Everybody's talked about that today. But we need to really start harnessing it in our communities as a resource. We need to start working on permeability, but we can't work on perme permeability until we've thought of rainwater as a resource, until we've built soil that can infiltrate. So all of this stuff starts to come together. And then we want to design with native plants because ultimately that will be the thing that brings our place uh, into the future and into water sustainability and reliability. And then IPM is just a critical aspect of all of this, and you're, you're going to see me talk a little bit more about um, a sort of a different aspect of what Cheryl talked about. So identity. A number of people put your hands up and said, yes, we live in a desert climate. And Kristen said, no, we don't. And it's true, we don't live in a desert climate. We live in a very rare and unique climate. One of five in the world, we share this climate with South Coast of Chile, South Africa, the countries ringing the Medi Mediterranean basin, and Southwest Australia. But do you know what? We have way more different than we have in common. All we really share in common with the Mediterranean regions of the world is that we're summer dry and winter wet. We get, whether they're in the northern or southern hemisphere, they get most of their rain in the winter and they go through long periods of drought every year. That's the main thing. And when you go to the plant nurseries and you go to your, many of tr your traditional growers, you are presented plants as if they're all created equal and they're not. In all of these places, the rainfall differs, the soil ecology differs, the flora, the fauna, everything is different. Ultimately, the only thing we have in common is that we're between 31 and 44 degrees latitude and we have long periods of drought every year. And the rainfall is quite different in many of these too, sometimes double. So when I look in our communities, here's what I see. In non-Mediterranean climates, this is the gardening pattern, the landscaping pattern, the sort of flow that we all get into when we're working on our landscapes. And basically, it's a continuum. It, at the, on the left is winter, on the right is winter, summer is in the middle, right? So you with me? It goes from winter, summer to winter. The blue signifies precipitation, could be snow. The yellow signifies temperature. And you will notice in non-Mediterranean climates, the big blob of green. The green is when you should be planting, establishing, and getting a new garden in place and established. This is how we manage many of our landscapes in Orange County. This is the model we use. You can see it as you drive around. This is the model that our irrigation systems are built on. But what our native plants evolved with is actually this model. And this is where we start to bump into trouble in our climate. And this is why we need to understand our climate in order to be able to use all of these other principles. And that is that in our climate, we should really use summer to design. And we should use, and to research, we should use fall to plant, we should establish over the winter, and then we want our plants to hunker down in the summer and they can look beautiful while they're doing it for July, August, and September. We can plant in the summer too, but if you're going to do that, you need to educate yourself on how to do it and how to establish plants correctly. And it sometimes means turning topsy-turvy everything you know about irrigation and how to establish a plant. One thing I notice when I drive through Orange County, and I wish I had one of those little, like, I could see those little thought bubbles popping up through landscapes, and they were flags, and I see Korea, and I see China, and I see all these other places. Mostly what I see is ye old Merry England, because that is where much of our sort of legacy thinking about landscape design comes from, is from the landscape park. We don't look like a landscape park. This is what we look like in our environments. And so if we're going to start connecting our communities to our greater environment, for all the people who love landscape design, this is one way to do it, is to utilize the watershed approach. Now, when we use the garden 
pattern or the landscaping pattern of another place, the non-Mediterranean climates. And so we know if we're going to use that pattern, we have to water in summer. And when we have to water in summer and we want to use, uh, a, we want to be um, judicious with water, well then we're given recycled water. And did you know that recycled water is very high in salts, right? And salts are dangerous to most plants and most plant roots. And so then what happens is we have to choose plants from a plant palette that's given to us by our consultants and our contractors and all of those people, a salt-tolerant plant list. Do you know where most of those plant lists come from? Plants commonly used in the landscape. So they're kind of a feedback loop. Less than 3% of these lists typically are um, populated by native plants. So they're giving you lists based on somebody else's climate that um, teaches you how to grow things in a salt marsh environment. That's what many of these lists actually end up being. Not only that, many of these lists will include plants that are invasive to us here in Southern California. So when you um, are implementing the watershed approach, it's wise to just simply start to question the information you're getting and why you're getting it. I was once at a grower event, I want to say about three years ago, and very proudly the grower of this very rose said, you are going to love this rose. It has no pest problems. It is as close to plastic as you can get in a living thing. <laughs> and nobody gasped but me. I'm looking around thinking, oh, that's terrible. But for people who are used to looking at landscapes as purely an exercise in aesthetics, this is what you want. But in reality, our pollinators can't use this rose. It's been bred over so many successive generations to close them out with the double flowers. They can't get in there. It doesn't produce a fragrance anymore. So these plants become just for us. Now, I'm not saying, many of you in your communities, you have these plants. So I'm not saying that you can't use these plants, but when you're using them, be conscious of how you're using them and when you're using them. Know that they're only for you, and maybe put them at the guardhouse in a nice little planter and feed them what they need. But the rest of your landscape, start bringing back the watershed approach principles. So our plants have adapted, they really do have super superpowers, as Kristen was alluding to. They have adapted the ability to heal soil. All plants build the landscape they want for themselves. All plant cr plants change landscapes in their favor. So do we want to plant plants that change landscapes in a favor that is towards health and sustainability and, and um, less pest issues? Yes. So some of our plants fix nitrogen. They take atmospheric nitrogen. They have a relationship with biology at their root zones. They use the nitrogen in you know food and plant available form in their leaves while they're living but as these little flowers drop as these little leaves drop they get released back to the soil so we want to leave leaves on the soil that's why they're called leaves people I just saw this yesterday, the blower on the landscape blowing the leaves off the landscape. And when you do that, you're blowing the immune system of the plant off the landscape too. Our plants also have another superpower, and that is that they're extremely efficient at reflecting heat and holding water. And oftentimes those plants are silver. Notice I didn't say gray. People will say to me, I don't like gray plants. And I will say, well, learn to like gray plants because they are extremely resilient in our environment with our climate the way it is. And then, of course, we have beautiful flowering plants that pollinators can get at. Okay, brief story about soil because that is essential to, to understand what good soil is and what good soil is not so that you can um, build good soil that will infiltrate water. The soil on the left is taken from an HOA community under a lawn. Half an hour later, the soil sample on the right was taken. I want to say it's about an 18-inch soil sample up in, uh, on a hillside very close to the, the gates of Camp Pendleton. The one on the left, you can see what happens in the landscapes under a lawn when we have years of irrigation water and salt and compaction. And you can see that water won't infiltrate. It'll hit those compaction layers and it'll just start to move laterally. Salt is death to plants. And you can see that most of the action in a plant's kind of the health of a plant comes from its root zone. And there's a little tiny bit of health over there, about an inch of it on the left-hand side under the lawn where the roof, root zone of that uh, turf would have been. But the right is from a wild hillside, a healthy looking wild hillside filled with native plants and not weeds. That soil sample is utterly different and scientists will tell you it will take between 100 and 500 years to create one inch 
of soil through natural processes. That was about an 18-inch soil core. And you know what else? The one on the left, I had to literally stomp on to get it into the ground. The one on the right went in like butter, and they were taken half an hour apart. So when we think about implementing native plants on our in our communities, we have to know that we don't have native soil there. We have some other thing, and we have to start to learn to build soil in order to make our communities resilient to not only to help the plants grow, but to perme uh, permeate water as well. Soil biology import is important. The one tip I would give to the contractors, I know you are all used to taking chemistry tests. You all take chemistry tests. Find a source for biology tests, because it's the biology that oftentimes makes the chemistry. And so if all you're doing is remediating chemistry, you can be negatively impacting the biology, and you end up with things like the parasitic root nematodes, because there's no biology in your soil, and so it starts to attack the plants. So you need to test the biology, learn how to read a biology, um, soil sample and there are lots of people who can help you do that. When you're doing your landscape walks, instead of looking at how a plant looks, start to look bef at, at the evidence of plant problems in the future like compaction. Try to start to look for compaction and things that you know will implement, uh, will influence plants later. And so use your landscape walks a little bit differently. And then soil and, and water work together. When you are focused on infiltrating water, you're going to need to regrade some of your areas. Kristen showed you the native, um, the native planted slope. Did you notice the difference between the native planted slope and the one on the other side? The one on the other side was graded for runoff. The native planted slope was graded for rain infiltration. So look for opportunities as you're revamping areas of your communities to start to infiltrate water in to eliminate runoff. We can virtually eliminate runoff. And while you're at it, see if you can take some water from your buildings and put it into your landscape. The mantra for um, permeability in the landscape is slow it, spread it, and sink it. You want to sink it as close to the source as you possibly can. You want to avoid speeding it up and having it um, sort of slam into the, the uh, storm drain system. This is kind of a cool thing that I can see that up there, actually. Oh, and when you're working on your hardscapes, think permeable there, too, because that is the source of much of our runoff. So if you're redoing your p pathways and your patios, there, are, uh, there is a wealth of permeable hardscape materials where you can start to, again, spread that water and slow it and sink it on site. For designers, there is a native plant or a near native plant, let's say within 100 miles of here or 200 miles of here, as opposed to plants from you know, thousands of miles of here, that solve every design dilemma, from spiky things to beautiful, soft, fluffy things. And when many of us think about our iconic plants, we think about the coast live oak. But do you know that we have an iconic plant here in Orange County? It's our oak, the Engelman oak, that is virtually gone. There, are, there used to be a lot of it. Now there are maybe three or four stands of it. Let's start bringing that back into our community. Bring it into your hillsides. Bring it into your um, common areas. And you'll see that you will have a whole ecology around it that will blossom. And then subtle and soft, are, if you look up in our landscapes, you can have that, or you can have dramatic and bold. So you make the choice. It doesn't have to look one way. Um, Cheryl already talked about this. Know the beneficials. Know what your threshold is. All the stuff about IPM. But I'm going to add something to that, and that, that is that when you have something planted in your property that is a host plant for something, know what it is. So don't freak out if you come and you look at your winter senna and it's covered in caterpillars because they are meant to be there and they won't kill the plant and they will emerge to these delightful butterflies that will only enhance your community. Invite birds. If all you have is crows in your community, something's up. Invite birds in the more diverse bird populations that you have. That is evidence of a more diverse um, landscape and more health. And so I'm going to just run these down as practical tips that you can implement in your landscapes starting today. The first is design in summer, plant in fall, work with our climate the way it is. Grade for rain and not runoff. Look for opportunities to start to recontour your land for rain. Build soil for plant health. 
of don't think clay equals compaction. Any soil can be well structured and any soil can be compacted. So start to figure out why you're compacting your soil and start to relieve it. And then invite beneficials of all kinds. Start to know what they look like, what their larval form is, so that you will know when they've come to, um, to take care of your, your plants. Keep in mind, the prey will always come before the predator. So when you put in a new landscape, the predators aren't going to come first, right? So waiting and seeing is a big uh, part of IPM. Reduce summer water after a year. You'll kill ceanothus if you keep summer watering it after the first couple of years. So keep in mind these plants have that climate model uh, that requires dryness in summer. Doesn't mean you shouldn't water them to keep them looking good, but you need to figure out how to water them, when, and as Kristen said, deeply and infrequently, no little dribbles on the top. The top four inches should be dry. And then the last uh, point is to choose plants carefully and plant right. And I'm going to give you one tip that pretty much none of the contractors here do that will almost guarantee that your fa failure rate with plants will drop to nothing. And that is pre-water the holes when you plant. Make the holes hospitable for the plants you're going to put in them. I can't tell you how many times I've seen plants out of their pot in sites while the people have gone to lunch. That plant's already in the school of hard knocks. So we want it to be in, integrated into your landscape in a, um, oh, and plant the crown high. That's the second thing. Plant the crown high, pre-water the holes, and it'll be integrated in your landscape in a very gentle way, and you'll have less plant failures. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you, and I hope you implement some of these guides. Wasn't she fantastic? She'll be available also uh, uh, afterwards. She also presents at a lot of the Moulton Niguel landscape workshops, so we know we'll be continuing to see around ec excellent work. Uh, again, on behalf of the Moulton Niguel Water District and the uh, City of Laguna Niguel, thank you all for coming. <laughs>